Hello, everybody. Um, so welcome to the uh, JuliaCon 2021 Quantum Computing Workshop. If you can hear and see us, uh, can you just let us know in the chat so we know that the stream is actually working? I get the impression the stream is working because I had it open in another tab and just heard my echo. So I think we're good. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to our workshop. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, oh, there we go. There's the hellos. Um, those seem to be working. So uh, today we're going to be talking about um, basic quantum computing with uh, the Julia language and also Amazon Bracket, which we both work on. So I'm Catherine Hyatt uh, at KS Hyatt on GitHub. And um, SK, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, hi, my name is uh, Saravana Kumar, but I go by SK, so it's easier for everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I'm a software engineer. I work with Catherine on uh, AWS Packet, and I'm excited to be here uh, to uh, talk about quantum computing on uh, Packet. Enjoy. Uh, great. So we wanted to get started um, by just pointing everyone at where the notebooks for this workshop are located. So. Um, for today's workshop, we're going to be going through a series of, of Jupyter Notebooks. You're absolutely welcome to clone the repo and go through the work, uh, go through the workshop with us. Or if you want to just um, sit back, relax, and watch, that's fine too. So uh, if you're looking for the repository with the notebooks, um, it's been posted in the chat. Um, and this repository also includes setup instructions, uh, how to get started, um, installing the necessary packages in Julia and in Python. Um, so we're going to spend the first 10 minutes uh, just getting every, giving everybody some time to join the stream. And also, uh, if you would like to follow along, giving people some time to get set up with uh, the necessary installations. Um, so one thing to note is if you're comfortable using Docker, we do have a Docker file you can use to just install an image with everything ready to go. Um, if you have any problems with that, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, if you want to start by just cloning um, this GitHub repository and following the instructions to get set up, uh, go right ahead. Um, and again, hello, everybody. Oh, and one thing we should also mention, if you would like to ask questions during the workshop, please go to juliacon.org and register for the conference because if you do that, you'll get an email with a link to the official Q&A. So we won't be answering questions from the YouTube chat. We will be taking questions on Pigeonhole. Um, so if you go there, you can ask questions, vote on which questions you'd like us to answer. Um, and uh, that's where all of the official Q&A for the workshop is going to happen. Um, so please, again, if you're not already registered for JuliaCon, register while we wait for people to trickle in and get set up. Yeah, so we're going to get started um, in about five minutes. Uh, so if you're going through the setup procedure right now, um, you've got about five minutes to finish it. Um, if it doesn't work out, that's totally fine. You can just watch us go through the materials um, and finish the procedure later. Ask us questions on Discord if you run into trouble, or ask on Julia's Slack. Um, and we're going, um, we're, uh, we're going to get started at about 10 past the hour. set up the easiest way is probably to run the the docker command that's posted at the beginning of the readme um and that'll get you just straight up and running and uh with a jupyter instance on your browser
Um, there's an anonymous question on pigeonhole about um, whether you need any prerequisites for this workshop. Um, you typically don't need it, but it would help. Um, but you're not required to know any quantum computing before uh, this workshop. Um, yeah, our goal with this workshop is to have it be mostly accessible um, to, uh, to people without a large background in quantum computing. Um, so at the end of the workshop, we're going to present some resources if you'd like to learn more about quantum computing in general. So if the first time you go through this with us, it seems pretty confusing or you only get about 30% of it, that's totally fine. Uh, quantum computing is a big field and it was confusing for me the first time as well. Um, so definitely feel free to come back and either watch the workshop again or go through the introductory materials. We're gonna present um, three hours, is not a lot of time to introduce everybody to such a big field. And I know we have a lot of people with different backgrounds um, attending JuliaCon, so hopefully, uh, so there'll be something valuable to take away for everyone. Uh, so in about one more minute, we're going to get going. Um, uh, so if you want to, if you're all set up and ready to go with the Jupyter server, um, the notebook we're going to work through first uh, is um, this is our introductory one. Um, so you're going to want to go to number two, Intro to Quantum Computing with Amazon Bracket. Um, that's what we'll be in a second. Um, so just a quick preview right before we get started. We're going to be covering a variety of different topics today, including um, some basics of quantum computing, using hybrid quantum classical algorithms to do optimization, um, and then quantum machine learning. So I'm going to cover basics. Um, SK is going to jump in and cover a bunch of really cool quantum machine learning topics. I'll be back in a bit uh, to talk about optimization. And SK is going to finish on a high note with more very cool quantum machine learning content. Um, OK, um, so we're now at 10 minutes in. Um, let's get started. Uh, let me just increase my font size so this is visible for people who don't have like 8K monitors. Um, yeah, so thanks again for joining us for the workshop. Um, so we're going to start off here with a very basic introduction to some quantum computing concepts. Uh, again, if some of this is really unfamiliar to you or um, you feel like you don't understand a huge amount of it, that's totally fine. Um, definitely would encourage people to come and revisit this material if it's super confusing later. Um, and also, uh, just one last item, if you are having Docker permission issues, there's some help that's been posted in the stream chat, um, just so everybody can very quickly get caught up. Um, so what we're going to cover today uh, is a bunch of um, interesting uh, material in the field of quantum computing in this. No, but we're going to specifically cover some very basics of constructing quantum circuits with Rocket. Um, talk about some uh, cool, simple examples of circuits we can construct and measurements we can make. Um, so throughout the workshop, we're going to be using the Amazon Bracket local simulator. So as SK and I both said, we work on Amazon Bracket. Um, so I'll explain what exactly that is. Um, the most important thing is that you do not need an AWS account to participate at all in this workshop, um, whether you're watching it live or later. It can be completed 100% on your local machine um, or a cloud instance um, uh, wherever you're using it. Um, so after the workshop, if you would like to try using some of Amazon Bracket's managed quantum simulators or use a real quantum um, computing device, which Amazon Bracket offers, you absolutely can. You'll need to create an AWS account to do that. If you're interested, again, please hit us up on Discord or Julia Slack, and we'll be happy to talk to you more about how to do that. 
Um, so just to quickly um, introduce things, uh, if um, you're not familiar with it, Amazon Bracket is a fully managed quantum computing service that helps researchers, um, developers, really anybody who's interested in quantum computing get started in the field and accelerate the research they're doing um, and discovery of new quantum algorithms. So we provide a development environment for you that lets you test out different quantum algorithms. You can try them on classical quantum circuit simulators or even run them on real quantum hardware that exists today. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, there's a lot of documentation online, which you can read, we've linked to it. Um, so we provide access to a bunch of different circuit simulators and hardware providers, as I said, including different quantum device architectures, for example, um, superinducting qubits or trapped ion quantum computing. Um, and so some of these simulators that we provide, um, SV1, TN1, and DM1, uh, are managed devices, which means they run on infrastructure that is AWS managed. Um, and software that's also AWS managed. Um, but the one simulator we're going to be using today, the local simulator, runs on your computer. Um, and hopefully you are all able to follow the pre-workshop instructions to get set up with the local simulator. Um, so this simulator uh, uses software that we've written, but it runs entirely on your hardware, which means you don't have to pay to use it. Uh, so a natural question that you might be interested in, if you're a little bit familiar with the quantum computing ecosystem, is why we aren't using Yao for this workshop. So Yao.jl is a really great package um, that has been uh, I think in existence for several years now. It's been developed by the Quantum BFS group. Um, and uh, I think actually last year, they also gave either a workshop or a talk about Yao. Um, so our goal with our workshop today is to give sort of a very bottom up introduction to quantum computing. So the syntax we're gonna be using is a bit different from what Yao.jl uses. And we will build up, for example, some training procedures or quantum machine learning algorithms um, that are built directly on top of the local simulator. Um, so if after this workshop, you say to yourself, you know what, I really don't like the way they went about doing this. I actually like Yao a lot better Then absolutely use Yao.jl. Um, it's a really great package. I strongly recommend it for people who are interested in quantum computing and Julia. Um, they have a lot of really good templates for various quantum algorithms. Um, and so our goal today is to show you how some of these uh, templates arise, how you can sort of build your own quantum algorithms in Julia. Um, and if you're interested in going further with that with Yao, 100%. It's a very good package. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, one other exciting little fact is that the Yao team is planning to support Amazon Bracket as a backend for some of their simulators um, and even let you, again, run on real quantum devices. They have a new package out for that um, that we've linked here. So if you're interested, uh, definitely go check that out. I'm sure they would love to have more people testing it. Um, OK. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do um, is just run some package imports. Uh, in this case, we need PyCall, AWS, um, and this is going to take a second. Uh, um, and then after that, uh, we're going to import some, uh, some of the bracket packages from Python. So the bracket simulator is entirely written in Python. Um, and we're going to be using PyCall to interact with it, but almost all of the code we write today is going to be in Julia, and then we'll just um, call out to Python to interact directly with the simulator. Um, cool. So in particular, we're going to import the main bracket AWS uh, module, um, the module that describes interacting with quantum devices, and uh, probably not too surprising, the module that talks about how we can interact with quantum circuits in bracket. Um, and finally, we're also going to do some Jupyter magic to hijack Python's printing so that, for example, if we would like to print circuit diagrams, we'll be able to do that. Um, so that's what these last two lines here are doing. Cool. Uh, and so, like I mentioned, throughout this tutorial, we're going to be using the bracket local simulator. Um, and this runs entirely on a computer that you control. So, for example, that could be your laptop or a desktop. Um, or some Jupyter notebook that runs in the cloud, or an EC2 instance, or even a Raspberry Pi, although I wouldn't recommend running it on Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, using this simulator is hyper percent free, so you will never need an AWS account to use it. Um, it's a state vector simulator. And what that means is that the amount of memory we need to do a simulation scales exponentially in the number of qubits we want to use in the circuit. Um, this happens because in a state vector simulator, we store a full representation of the quantum state in memory. And to do that, we need 
2 to the n um, complex numbers, where n is the number of qubits in the circuit. Uh, and so for this reason, throughout this workshop, we're going to run circuits on relatively few numbers of qubits, i.e. less than 18. Um, this is just because, uh, you know, there's many different people attending this workshop. They may not have uh, machines with a lot of RAM in it. Um, so we wanted to make the workshop accessible to everyone. However, if you personally have a machine with a lot of RAM available, or you're running this on a cloud instance with a lot of RAM, you can definitely feel free to go to higher qubit numbers. Um, but uh, in the interest of making this accessible to everyone, and also our circuits finishing on time, we're going to re be restricted to small numbers of qubits. Um, and it also means that our simulations are going to finish faster, which is also nice. Um, and so if you're interested in running simulations with more qubits, one option is to either find yourself a computer with more RAM, or another one would be to use the manual simulators that are available on AWS. Um, and again, if you're interested in doing that, uh, you can talk to us or read the AWS documentation. Um, one thing to note, if you do decide to onboard with Bracket on AWS, you receive a free hour of simulator time per month for your first 12 months on the service. Um, so all that is to say we are going to use uh, the device's local simulator device from the Bracket Devices module. Um, And uh, just to address a very quick question that popped up in the stream chat, um, so any package you need to install on the Julia side, we will install at the top of any notebook that's going to use it. So um, when we get to that notebook, you'll be able to uh, install all the packages you need. OK. So we're gonna just going to jump right in and start building some quantum circuits. Um, so I hopefully we'll go through this slowly enough um, that it's uh, relatively accessible to everyone. Um, but again, if this is super confusing, um, everyone, please feel free to sound off in the stream chat, and I'll try and slow it down a little bit or go back over things. Um, OK. So the first thing we're going to do is the world's simplest quantum circuit. We're going to build a simple bell pair and make some measurements on it. So if you're not familiar with what a bell pair is, um, a bell pair is a set of two qubits, which are maximally entangled. Um, so bell pairs, unlike pairs of classical bits, uh, can exhibit quantum behavior that is not explainable with classical mechanics. Um, and testing if you can reliably produce such bell pairs is a good way to see if your quantum device um, could perform any kind of quantum computation at all. Um, so uh, what we're going to do um, is apply two gates, uh, the Hadamard and controlled knot. Um, so some of you who uh, maybe have some CS background. Remember gates like controlled knot from a classical computing context. So the quantum controlled knot gate is an, al an analog of that. Um, it flips the gate. Um, uh, it flips one of the gates. It's uh, one of the qubits it's applied to, depending on the state of the uh, of the qubit it's addressing. So what we're going to do is use Hadamard to put the first qubit into a superposition of zero and one states, and then our C knot controlled knot gate, which is equivalent to the CX gate, flips the second qubit if and only if the first one is in the one state. Um, so one thing to note throughout this entire workshop is that um, the bracket SDK is written in Python. Um, and although we're all uh, at a Julia conference, um, so we're probably all thinking in the one-based indexing paradigm, uh, Python um, made the strange choice to use zero-based indexing. So throughout this workshop, all qubits start at zero. Um, and if you start writing your own code uh, and hit bugs, um, just check your, your one versus zero-based indexing. I've been bitten by this many times. So, um, so here's our circuit, our simple bell circuit. Uh, we call the constructor that builds the circuit. We apply a Hadamard H on gate zero, and then a C naught on zero and one. So in bracket, this lets us build a iteratively add chunks to a circuit or add gates to a circuit. Um, and then using the device we selected, the local simulator, we can run our bell circuit um, and make a certain number of measurements on it. So in the bracket SDK, uh, the number of measurements I want to make on the circuit is called the number of shots. So effectively, what we're simulating here is if I had a real quantum computer and I prepared the circuit on it and then measured the output state 100 times, what should I see? Um, or what would, um, what would be a reasonable outcome of that? So if I run this, um, you'll see that uh, this generates a task. And I can query the result of that task. 
And in particular, I'm interested in the measurement counts. So what measurement counts is going to tell us is what possible um, output bit strings could I measure as a result of running this circuit. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, we get that there's a mixture of 0, 0 and 1, 1. Um, so that means about 50% of the time, we measure that both qubits are in the zero state. And about 50% of the time, we measure that both are in the one state. And that isn't that surprising, because as I said above, we're, we're um, constructing a bell state. So the qubit on zero starts in the zero state. And then we put it in a 50-50 superposition of zero and one with Hadamard. Uh, and then 50% of the time, we flip the second qubit using control dot. So it's actually pretty reasonable that we would get 0, 0, and 1, 1 out at the end. Um, and then the bracket SDK also allows us to print our circuit. Um, this is why we overrode uh, the STD out for Python. Um, and if we print um, the circuit, we can see that I have two qubits here, Q0 and Q1. I've applied the Hadamard to the first qubit. And then CX or C0 um, to both qubits. Um, and then these numbers up here show you the circuit depth. So um, how many layers of gates have we applied uh, in this circuit? So uh, this functionality, the ability to print your circuits is pretty nice if you want to be able to sort of understand what it is you actually created. Or if you're like me and you constantly make off by one errors, uh, it's a very nice way to be able to check your work and make sure that you actually uh, created the circuit that you would like to create. Um, and so uh, we can also use this bracket SDK to make measurements. So there's two kinds of measurements that are of interest to us if we're doing quantum computing, um, exact measurements and sampling or um, inexact measurements. So uh, we already made a sampling measurement where shots is greater than zero. So uh, as I said a moment ago, um, when we make a sampling measurement with n shots, we simulate the results of running the circuit n times. Um, as if it were on a real quantum device, uh, important caveat here for now without noise. Um, so here we're imagining I have a perfect quantum computer and I make n computations of the same circuit. What results should I expect to see? Um, but when we make an exact measurement, we're going to simulate what the result ought to converge to if I made infinitely many measurements. Um, so for example, in the Bell example above, Eventually, if I ran an infinite number of shots, or what we in the SDK call shots equal zero, um, the measurement probabilities of 0, 0, and 1, 1 should be exactly 0 0.5 each. Um, and so for this reason, measurement counts is only supported for sampling or shots greater than zero computations. Um, but for example, we can ask our simulators to compute other kinds of measurements, like expectation values. So if there's some observable we would like to measure um, at the end of our circuit execution. Um, or variances of that observable, um, or amplitudes, we can measure those with uh, the exact um, form of measurement. And we can also compute expectations and variances for shots greater than zero. So what we're going to do in the example below is compute the expectation value of an X gate on both qubits using our Bell circuit. Um, so at first, we're going to perform a shots greater than zero measurement. Uh, and what the simulator will actually do in this case is uh, evaluate the circuit um, effectively 100 times and then compute uh, a distribution of results and generate expectations and variances from that distribution of output bit strings. Um, so the gate we would like to measure is x, which is an observable x. Um, we tell the circuit we'd like to measure at the end an expectation value. Uh, so here we can use Python pi calls great interpolation feature. Uh, for those of you familiar with Python, what we're doing here is just doing a Kronecker product of x times x um, to generate a gate that is applied to both qubits. Uh, we tell the bracket SDK what is the target, um, 0 and 1, because those are the only two qubits in our circuit. Uh, and then we run the task uh, on our local simulator device with 100 shots. And the first value in the results um, is indeed the expectation value if I apply x gates at the end of the circuit on both qubits. Um, I also see in the chat that somebody asked, what is that hmm noise? So the answer to that um, is that I am based in New York City, and that is my air conditioner. Um, so I'm sorry if it's annoying. Uh, it's very hot here today. Uh, 
And similarly, we can also compute the expectation value in the exact case. Um, and ideally, the two results should be pretty similar because this is a pretty simple circuit. That won't always be the case. Uh, for some circuits, you can see a pretty big uh, variation between shots greater than zero and shots equal to zero, especially if the variance of the expectation value is very high. Um, so in general, it's not a big shock if there's a, a discrepancy between the two, but in this simple case, we'll see that the results should match. Um, so again, we ask for uh, the expectation value um, on, a, on our Bell circuit of X on both qubits. Um, but the difference here is that shots is exactly equal to zero now. And if I run this, indeed, I see that the expectation value is exactly the same up to floating point noise. Um, Uh, someone in the chat mentions that they think it was my personal quantum computer. Sadly, no, I do not have a dilution fridge in my apartment. Um, I don't think my landlord would be okay with that. <laughs> and then finally, we can compute variances. Uh, so in addition to expectation values, which you can think of as like if I measure this operator many times, what should the mean be? I would also like to perhaps compute the variance around that mean. Um, and uh, again, we construct a Bell circuit. Now we're going to use a different observable Z. Um, so here we're going to apply a Z gate on the first qubit. Um, and we want to measure the uh, sort of mean we should see after doing many measurements on it. And we'd also like to know the variance. Um, and so we run this circuit on our device um, in an exact form and then compute the output values. Um, and we see that the first value, which is the expectation, which is what we asked for first, is zero. Um, and the variance is one. So for a Bell circuit, this makes sense. Because as, like, as we said earlier, and as we saw earlier, um, there's two possible output states, zero, zero, and one, one. And they occur with about equal probability. So if you're measuring, uh, is this first qubit in the zero or one state, um, and it's equally likely to be in either one, then the expectation value um, uh, should be zero um, with a uh, variance of one. Um, and, uh, oh, there's another question. Sorry, I said I was not going to answer questions from the stream chat, but it looks like I am. Um, so Krishna asked, just for a clarification, uh, I can actually put this. Oh, look at this. Um, I can uh, put this on the stream. Why do, why do we need to use the Kronika product? Um, so that's a great question. In this case, it's because I would like to measure, I would like to make a measurement on two qubits, but the X gate is a single qubit gate. So I put by, I, I take the Kronecker of X, Kronecker X, to turn a single qubit gate into a two qubit gate. Um, hopefully that, that addresses this question. And now I can hide it. Um, and so finally, we can also measure, um, amplitudes with the bracket SDK. So an amplitude um, is an idea that's kind of unique to quantum mechanics. Um, what we're going to do is uh, execute the circuit, and at the end of it, we're going to compute the overlap of a particular bit string we're interested in, um, which I'll call little c, with the final output wave function. So the square of the amplitude is the probability of observing state little c when we make a final measurement. Um, there's really no analog in classical mechanics for the amplitude, so it's a little hard to explain by analogy. Um, the amplitude is also always a complex number. Um, and then if you square it, uh, you get a real number, i.e. the probability, um, a real positive number. Uh, also, I'm glad I answered your question, uh, Krishna. Uh, so we're again going to construct uh, everybody's favorite bell circuit. Um, you guys are probably getting a little bit tired of this. Uh, and then we're going to compute amplitudes for all possible two qubit output states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we're going to compute an exact measurement, shots equal to 0. Um, and again, we'll run the task on the device and show the first value, which will be all of our amplitudes. Um, and again, thanks to the wonderful magic of PyCall. Um, thank you, Stephen Johnson, for this incredible package. Uh, we'll get a dictionary out which will show us the amplitudes of each of our output states. Um, 
So again, we see uh, that zero, zero has amplitude square root two. Um, one, one has amplitude square root two, sorry, one over square root two. Uh, so if we square those, we'll get probability one half of observing each of these two output states. And then the other two have amplitude zero. So there's zero probability of observing each of these states. Um, so that was just a basic introduction of how to construct circuits in bracket, the kinds of measurements we can make, um, and some simple examples of the world's sort of um, uh, most introductory quantum circuit. Um, so one thing to note here also is that uh, here, again, we've been using the local simulator the entire time, but if you were using one of the AWS managed simulators or um, one of the QPUs we provide access to, all you would have to do is go back up to this line here and just change the device to let's say like IonQ or Rigetti, and then you could just run all of this code again, but now on a real QPU. So with one code change um, using the SDK, you can switch from a simulator um, that you control to a managed one to one of the real QPUs, which is pretty cool. Um, okay. Uh, and then finally, here are some suggestions um, for things you can explore a little bit further on your own. Uh, either after this workshop, um, during downtime on this workshop, if you get bored of hearing me talk, or during the hackathon. Um, so one thing you could try, for example, would be to modify our bell circuit with different gates. If you replace C0, for example, with controlled Y, what happens? Does it change the amplitudes? Um, does it change the expectation values? Um, another option you could consider is whether there's a way to extend this procedure to um, for circuits which have more than two qubits. Um, so can you construct uh, a circuit that will generate uh, states which are either all zeros or all ones? Um, these states are called cat states because uh, they're actually very hard to produce physically. Um, and they're like sort of Schrodinger cat states. That's where the name comes from. So if you get stuck doing this um, or just frustrated, uh, try searching online for what's called a GHZ state. Um, it might be instructive. Uh, so throughout this workshop, we're going to provide suggestions of ways you can explore a little bit more on your own, um, or things you can ask us about on Discord later. Uh, great. Uh, so the next example I wanted to go to was another sort of famous introductory quantum computing topic, uh, super dense coding. Um, so the idea here is that we would like to use a shared resource between two people, the will, through the magic of quantum mechanics, allow them to send a message um, with fewer bits than are necessary classically. Um, so the key here is that our two, uh, our two people, let's say it's me and um, my awesome colleague SK, would like to share a message uh, with each other, but we're not physically co-located. Physically co so we need some way to communicate. Um, so obviously, classically, one example would be if I just picked up my phone and I texted SK, um, but we want to use quantum mechanics to solve our problem, and quantum texting rates uh, are pretty expensive, apparently, so we want to use a few bits to do this. Um, so to do so, we're going to prepare a shared entanglement resource, so each of us will have one qubit, but our qubits will be entangled, and then I can use my qubit, only applying gates to my qubit, to send a message to SK. Um, so for example, if you want like a, a real world use case for doing this, um, one example could be uh, if one of our coworkers is having a birthday and I need to secretly tell SK uh, which of four cake flavors to get. Um, this is a little bit of a silly example, but I'm able to do that um, using our A, our shared entanglement resource, and then B, applying gates to only one qubit after we've prepared the shared resource. Um, so. Again, we're going to prepare our bell state. Um, so this will be our shared entanglement resource. This is a set of two qubits, which are maximally entangled. Um, and so in this example, uh, because we all love the canonical language in this field, I called our two uh, message passers, Alice and Bob, but this could equally be you know, SK and I or, or friends of ours or whatever. Um, so the message sender, Alice, would like to send a message to Bob. They're now physically separated. Each one of them has retained ownership of their own qubit, and Alice will apply gates to her qubit, which will affect Bob's, and then once they meet again, they can combine, combine the qubits. Bob can make measurements and reconstruct the message. Um, and this is all possible only by making uh, changes to the first qubit that Alice had possession of when she was separated from Bob. Um, 
So there's four possible messages we can send. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Each of them has a different set of operations we'll perform only on Alice's qubit. Um, and so you can see each one has a different circuit associated with it, either the identity, uh, x on the first qubit, z on the first qubit, or x and then z on the first qubit. Um, and the claim is by making a measurement at the end of the day, Bob will be able to tell what, uh, what message Alice intended to send. Um, and so by running our message operator, um, we see that we've constructed a string, um, pi object dictionary. So the pi object is the representation of the circuit here, um, which encodes the circuit we would like to associate with each message. Um, and then we're going to send a message through the single qubit that we have access to. Um, just for the heck of it, I picked one one, but you could equally well pick either of them. We add the message circuit to our initially prepared um, bell state up here. And now Bob disentangles the two qubits by effectively applying the, uh, the bell state construction procedure in reverse um, and uh, generates um, generates the, me uh, the message. Um, sorry, I printed this in the wrong way earlier. Uh, so here we can see a representation of our circuit. Um, we initially performed the construction of the shared entangled resources, two qubits which were maximally entangled. Alice applies the message to qubit one, um, and then Bob, later in possession of both qubits, disentangles them to read off the message. Um, and so if we actually run our full circuit with a thousand shots, uh, we'll see that at the end of the day, the measurement counts um, are exactly 1-1, one, one, which is the message Alice hoped to send. Hooray! Uh, Bob will now buy the correct cake, hopefully, um, assuming he gets to the store. Okay. So that was just another quick introduction to sort of um, a famous area where you can see some advantage of using a quantum device, since you're now able to send what classically would require two bits. Um, by making modifications to only one qubit. Um, and it's also just another introduction of how we can use the SDK to sort of generate circuits, examine them, and make measurements on them. Uh, and then our last item in this section is gonna be talking about dense random circuits. So the circuits we examined so far are really simple and they're also all on a very small number of qubits. Um, so now we're gonna go completely different direction and look at circuits which are on many qubits um, and have a lot of gates. Um, and so these circuits are interesting because they can be used to test what's called quantum advantage. Um, so if I come to you and I say, I built a real quantum computer, it's awesome. It can do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, the first thing you would probably ask me is prove it. Um, and the way I would do that is by looking for a circuit where my computer exhibits what's called quantum advantage. So I want a circuit where my quantum device can execute it reliably, um, generate correct results much faster than the best classical supercomputer on Earth. Um, so this is kind of a moving target. There's been a lot of uh, publications about how to achieve quantum advantage, um, looking for circuits that accomplish useful tasks that quantum computers would have quantum advantage for. Um, and as you can see, it kind of depends on what is the best classical supercomputer capable of. Because if we came up with a better classical supercomputer tomorrow, it would be harder for existing quantum devices to win. Um, but this is a very active area of research. Um, and circuits like these are one area that's been investigated um, to show some kind of victory for existing quantum devices. Um, so what we're going to do is build sort of a little mock-up of some of these. Um, most circuits that are actually considered for quantum advantage are in many more qubits than we'll be able to consider here, but uh, just as sort of a prototype, we can try this now. Um, and we'll use some nice Julia functionality uh, to do this. Um, okay, so we're gonna import uh, Julia's random um, standard library, which is great. Uh, we're gonna set the seed to 42, the canonical best seed, um, and then we're gonna generate a circuit. So I've created this function, uh, very creatively named generate random circuit. Um, it takes two arguments, the number of qubits and how many layers I want in the circuit. Um, and then I have three functions defined internally to generate the three kinds of layers I'm interested in. A random layer of single qubit gates, um, a layer of two qubit gates that act only on even qubits, uh, and a layer of two qubit gates that act only on odd qubit 
uh, pairs. Um, and so uh, I think I forgot to turn on wrapping. All right, well, we're not going to worry about this right now. Um, <laughs> so in random single qubit layer, what we're going to do is we're going to generate an instruction to apply to the circuit by randomly choosing between one of three single qubit rotations, rotation along x, rotation along y, and rotation along z. Um, and the angle for the rotation is also randomly chosen. So that's why we set the seed earlier. Um, and then we're going to apply uh, this. Um, we're going to apply a rotation gate to every single qubit in the circuit in each of these single qubit gate layers. Um, and so the iteration over qubits runs from zero to the number of qubits minus one, again, because in Python, um, arrays start with zero. So in the bracket SDK, the first qubit is always zero. Then in the even two qubit layer, we're going to apply C naught, which we've met before, um, on uh, all qubits that uh, start with um, all qubits starting at qubit one. Um, so this will go from like one to two. Um, and then three to four, and then four to five, or sorry, five to six, um, all the way through uh, the entire circuit. And then the odd two qubit layer is very similar. It's just this connects using C naught zero and one, two and three, uh, four and five. Um, so these C naught gates are entangling. Um, and so the density of these kind of controls uh, how quickly the circuit is entangled how quickly qubits are entangled with each other, um, even at sort of pretty long distances in the circuit. Um, we create an array of these layer generating functions. Um, so the order in which we would like to apply them is the random single qubit layer, even a two qubit gates layer, again, the random singles, and then the odd two qubit layer. Um, so that's just saying like we want sort of to create like a pancake stack of these in this specific order. Um, and then, uh, using Julia's nice iteration functionality. We'll just cycle over this number of layer functions as for as many layers as we wanted in the first place, which we control with the input variable depth. Um, and for every single gate in the layer function, we just add that instruction to the circuit. And then at the end of the day, we return a circuit. Um, so I know this was kind of a lot happening all at once. Um, but effectively, what we're doing is um, sort of building up a procedure to very quickly uh, generate very deep circuits using some nice Julia iteration functionality. Okay. And so now we can generate a bunch of these circuits and visualize them. So uh, going between four and 12 qubits, again, sticking to small numbers. So that this is tractable with the local simulator. Um, and for a number of layers between, let's say, like five and 20, um, we generate the random circuit. We generate some states that we would like to measure the amplitude of. We print the circuit. Um, we run the circuit on the local simulator in the exact mode. Um, and then at the end of the day, we, we print the amplitudes we've measured. Uh, so I'll start running this. Um, you can see that uh, here we've got our single qubit layers um, and then our uh, two qubit layers, more single qubits, more two qubit layers. Um, so the SDK will pack the gates in as tightly as possible, which is good from an efficiency point of view, which is why um, in layer one here, you can see there's a rotation next to the CX gate. Um, and then we can see here at the output, we have a bunch of amplitudes coming out. You can see again that these are complex numbers, um, not simply uh, real numbers because these, these are the square, the square roots of probabilities. And so the reason this is interesting is that you can also use this for things like quantum validation. Um, so in the real world, again, if I come to you and I say, I have this wonderful quantum device, uh, it's solved quantum computing forever. Life is incredible. What you could say is, okay, uh, I've generated using a circuit that I want to run on your quantum device, all these amplitudes. So now it's your job to go run the circuit on the device and show that the actual, out the actual outputs you measure over many iterations, um, applying this circuit match the theoretically predicted amplitudes from the simulator. And that's one way that you can validate that the quantum device is working properly. Uh, so you can see as we go, the circuit diagram gets more and more complicated. Um, so the deeper these are, the harder it is for both a classical supercomputer to successfully simulate, and also um, the harder it is for a real quantum device, which uh, suffers from, for example, like errors and noise to simulate successfully. Okay, 
this is like a very long table. Uh, so that's kind of this, uh, the end of our very basic introduction section. Um, thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, again, I'm just going to end this with some suggestions for what you can explore further during uh, either the hackathon or any time you're interested, um, including before the hackathon. Uh, so one thing you could also try is in our dense random circuits, you could try introducing different gates than the ones I used. You could try some of the other two qubit gates that Bracket supports. If you're not sure what those are, definitely check the Bracket documentation. Um, but some examples would be swap, uh, I swap. Again, controlled X, controlled Y, controlled Z. There are others. You can even input your own random unitaries if you would like. Um, and you, you might ask yourself, do these affect the run times and the amplitudes that you observe uh, when you run with this circuit? Um, Bracket also has a lot of really great getting started um, or more advanced circuit algorithms tutorials. Um, these are mostly written in Python, but they should be pretty easy to translate to Julia if you want to get more into the weeds of the different kinds of circuits um, that can be run. For example, we have a nice tutorial about Grover search, uh, if you've ever heard that um, piece of jargon before. Um, so if you'd like to familiarize yourself a little bit more with sort of like the canonical examples of quantum circuits, uh, definitely recommend checking those out. Uh, otherwise, thanks for your attention. I'll be back later to talk about optimization. And SK is going to take it away uh, with a discussion about quantum machine learning. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I think Catherine basically <laughs> uh, gave you a PhD in the first, <laughs> first 30 minutes of this workshop. Uh, so um, hopefully, uh, there's a lot of experts in the audience now. Um, and we can uh, sort of go over this. Uh, super new experimental machine learning field, uh, quantum machine learning. Um, so, um, okay. So let's start with quantum neural networks, right? Um, hopefully, I'm just increasing the. Right. So, uh, hopefully, you can all see my screen. Uh, the text is big enough. Um, so we'll be. Uh, running through this concept called uh, quantum neural networks. Um, uh, so basically, the first step of this is to install all the required packages. Uh, we'll need uh, PyCall, AWS. Uh, we'll be using a little bit of Flux uh, and ML data sets. Um, if you are running this in the Docker container, then you probably don't have to do any of this uh, because it has all of the dependencies um, installed and um, set up. Okay, right. um, so we'll just import all of the required libraries. Um, just like in Catherine's notebook, we're going to be using the local simulator here, uh, but you can you can um, change this UPU to the ARN of the simulator or the managed simulator or the actual QPU that you want to run it on. And you can basically run this entire notebook either on the managed simulator or on the uh, on an actual quantum computer, uh, which is Brigetti and INQ. Um, so we can start our discussion discussion by uh, talking about what is classical deep learning, right? Um, so in classical deep learning, we, we use a neural network model uh, to make predictions or perform uh, a machine learning task. Um, like binary classification, clustering, um, uh, image classification, right? So to any classical deep learning algorithm, we have four components. We have a data set, which is d-dimensional, uh, along with the ground truth for each of the data points in the data set. Uh, we have a neural network model with trainable parameters. So the idea is that you have some um, optimal parameters that you can apply to your model, and when you've basically trained your model uh, to have those optimal parameters. You can take those parameters, you can take that model, uh, and you can use that to make a decision um, for whatever machine learning task that you're uh, that you're trying to use that model for, right? Uh, that could be like binary classification, um, image detection, um, object detection. Uh, so any one of these uh, like really cool machine learning tasks. Um, so the way that you would um, optimize your trainable parameters for your neural network model is by using an objective function. And the goal of the objective function is to tell us um, either how accurate or inaccurate the parameters for your model are. Um, 
for a particular set of data points, right? Uh, so let's say you wanted to do an object detection example, uh, <laughs> and um, let's say you wanted to detect hot dogs in in, a, in an image to say whether that image had a hot dog or not a hot dog, uh, then the objective function would basically tell you, well, the prediction that you've made uh, with that image is either right or wrong, whether it it ha whether you predicted that it has a hot dog and then it doesn't actually have a hot dog, then it will tell you that you're really far away and your parameters are wrong and you would have to optimize those parameters better uh, to get closer to the optimal solution, right? Um, and the way that you would adjust those parameters is by using an optimization routine. And what the optimization routine does is that it takes your uh, parameters, it takes the objective function that tells you how right or wrong you are, uh, and then takes, uh, and, and then tells you in what direction you need to move to um, get closer to the optimal set of parameters. And the optimization routine basically uh, takes that direction, applies it to your parameters, and then gets you closer and closer to the ideal solution. And that would give you the most optimal model that you can then apply onto, um, onto your test data and then make, uh, make, make set of predictions, right? So, what is quantum machine learning? So if you were to divide the entire machine learning landscape into the system that generates the data and the system that processes the data, um, then you can divide that into um, four separate quadrants, which is uh, classical data that's processed by a classical algorithm. Uh, this is very similar to um, like handwritten image classification. This is um, basically just classical machine learning. Any machine learning algorithm would fit into this quadrant, which is like classical data processed by classical algorithms. Um, then there's a scenario of uh, classical data processed by quantum algorithms. So we will use um, certain quantum techniques to apply to uh, classical data and um, see how that improves our uh, results. Uh, this could be classical machine learning tasks, except with uh, quantum uh, algorithms, right? And then the third scenario is quantum data processed by classical algorithms, which is machine learning for quantum computing. So if you are a machine learning expert and you want to uh, get involved in quantum computing, um, then this is basically saying, um, hey, there's some system producing uh, some quantum data. We can use machine learning to better understand that system, right? Uh, one example of this is uh, quantum tomography, where you use machine learning to um, understand either the state of the system um, or uh, the, um, the system itself better, right? Um, and then the last scenario is quantum data processed by uh, quantum algorithms, which is the data is generated by a quantum system and it's processed by uh, some quantum algorithm. Um, so generally, uh, I think the CC scenario has blown up in the last few years where it's um, wh where a lot of people are looking into how you can use uh, classical machine learning algorithms. Um, and you know, that's, um, that's, that's really popular. Uh, the most interesting scenario is the QQ scenario where we have the quantum data processed by quantum algorithms, but we don't have enough results in that direction. Um, and, you know, people are constantly exploring um, how that would work. Uh, but the other more popular direction and the one that we will be kind of approaching in this notebook or giving a good um, overview of is the uh, third scenario, which is um, sorry, the CQ scenario, which is the classical data processed by quantum algorithms. Right. Um, so how can you use data that we already have today uh, and perform tasks that we're already doing with classical algorithms, except can we replace those classical machine learning algorithms with um, some quantum algorithm? Right. So this is largely an area of research. Um, the biggest barrier, again, is the number of qubits uh, that are required to do this. Um, so right now, uh, this is at a really experimental state where people are trying to explore how you can use quantum algorithms to perform uh, classical machine learning tasks on classical data. And that would be, uh, say, image classification. Uh, there's even like research on how to apply this for reinforcement learning. Um, so this is this area is basically wide open and everybody is sort of looking at this right now. So if you're interested in this, um, in this area, then this is uh, something that you can look into and uh, make progress on, right? So 
in this notebook, what we're going to be looking at, or the problem that we're going to be looking at, is a really simple task, uh, which is parity detection. Uh, now, what parity detection is, um, if you're familiar with uh, computer science terminology, then um, parity detection is basically trying to understand the uh, how many how many um, ones are in your bit string, right? Is it is are there an odd number of ones or an even number of ones in your bit string? So if you have an odd number of ones in your bit string, then you label that as parity one. And if you have an even number of bit strings, then you label that as parity zero, right? Um, so basically your data would be these bit strings and then uh, your parity would be the label for those bit strings, right? If we go back to our um, a step of a data set, uh, the labels here would be the, um, the parity. Right. So we first define a function to um, generate the parity of a bit string. So if you give it a bit string, then it would tell you what the parity of that bit string is. Um, and then you, we can basically generate for a, any given um, n bit string. Uh, for any given um, like n, we can generate all of the bit strings um, for that n bits. So if your n bits was five, then you're generating all of the bit strings um, between zero to two power five, right? Uh, and then we split that data set into 30% uh, test set and then 70% training set. Uh, of course, in this example, that's, um, that's very little, um, but you'll see how that, that little data is enough for a problem that's not as complicated, right? Um, so we can sample a few points from the training set. Uh, you'll see that um, this is basically has two ones and the label for this uh, bit string is zero. And then it, this has three ones. So the label for this is um, one, right? So let's talk about how you can um, build a quantum machine learning model, right? So, in quantum algorithms, we have something called a variational quantum circuit. And what a variational quantum circuit is, is that it's a quantum circuit with parameters, right? Um, so each of the gates have some uh, either angle of rotation um, or some parameter that can be applied to it. And uh, the idea behind variational quantum circuits is that you can train them in the same way that you can train a classical neural network, because you, you have these parameters that you apply to those circuits and uh, those circuits can can output some measurement, and by modifying the uh, parameters, you can modify the output that that circuit um, gives you. Um, and by optimizing those parameters, you can now find the most optimal set of parameters that would give you the best results for uh, your particular task, which is very similar to how classical um, neural networks work, except you're replacing the neural network part with uh, with something called a variational quantum circuit, right? So to, to have a variational quantum circuit, you have two steps. One is the uh, state preparation and the other is the circuit, uh, circuit parameters. So let's talk about the first, first part, which is state preparation. Now your data is represented uh, classically, but then uh, quantum circuits only understand qubits, right? So how do you transform your uh, data from that classical domain into uh, into some um, in, into this uh, quantum domain, right? So the very first step in that process um, is to the, the simplest way in which you can do that uh, is to say because our bit string has zeros and ones, we can simply map the zero in our bit string to a zero state in the qubit. Um, and a one in our bit string to a one state in uh, one one qubit state, right? Um, so since the initial so circuits always like in at least in Amazon bracket the circuits start with a uh, with a qubit state of zero. So if you wanted to transform that qubit to a one state, then you would apply an x gate to that, right? Um, so what we can do is if you have a bit string of ones and zeros, then for every position in the bit string that has a one, you could apply um, X gate to the corresponding qubit in your circuit. So, say five, your circuit would be of size five qubits and you would apply an X gate to every qubit that corresponds to a one bit, right? Um, 
So you can see the, uh, so this is a utility function to convert a bit string to a circuit. And we can now visualize uh, that circuit, right? So we basically have a bit string 1010, and that would correspond to a quantum circuit uh, with X gates at the first and the second, uh, first and the third qubit, and identity gates at the um, second and the fourth qubits, right? So the qubit labeling starts from uh, zero to uh, so start from zero. So the qubit number and the qubit label are basically like minus one because the indexing for and one bracket starts with uh, zero, right? So let's talk about the actual. Um, quantum circuit, uh, which is what is the circuit that you're going to use, uh, or what is the circuit that you're going to apply the parameters to, to get a particular prediction, right? So in this case, um, we can have a n plus one qubit um, circuit where the n, where n is the number of uh, bits in your bit string. So if you had a five bit bit string, then the total number of uh, qubits in your circuit would be would be six qubits. And the reason that we have to do this is because um, you you can't reduce the number of qubits in, in the way that you can reduce the number of neurons in a neural network, right? Like you you basically, you can, uh, between layer to layer, you can reduce the number of neurons. And therefore, the last uh, layer, you could simply have a softmax function. And that would give you um, the uh, total number of classes that you have. And you can use that to make a prediction. Except in uh, quantum circuits, um, you you can't really do that. So what you would do is that you can have an extra qubit here that uh, where you can copy over the results from the first n bits to the final qubit to represent the label for your classification task. So what that means is that um, if you have an n bit string, uh, n bit bit string, then you would have an n plus one qubit circuit, and you would embed or uh, you would embed your input into the first n qubits in the way that we discussed before. And you would basically consider the last qubit as the label. And you would optimize for having the uh, label qubit, or you would measure the label qubit and optimize for the label qubit measurement being the correct label for that particular data. Right. Uh, if this doesn't make too much sense right now, that's okay. We'll be uh, we'll be going over this in in some detail just um, just below, right? Um, so in our in our n plus one qubit circuit, uh, we will use the R Y rotations, which is the rotation around the y axis, and for the label qubit, we'll use the rotation around the x axis, um, and then we'll use x x gates between every single qubit and the final qubit. Right, um, and you will measure the uh, last qubit and consider that to be the um, label for that um, for that particular data point. Right, so the code below uh, the QNN function basically takes a bit string as an input and then converts that bit string uh, into the circuit that we just discussed here. So given a bit string of size five, this will produce a circuit of uh, n plus one qubits um, with two n plus one parameters. Um, and that will um, that will be the circuit that we will be sort of optimizing uh, in the steps that come, come further, right? So um, let's talk about the circuit parameters next. Uh, so basically what this piece of code is doing is that it, it's simply just constructing that circuit. Um, and you can see that you, for a sample n bit of four, you have, uh, for a four bit bit string uh, of one zero one zero, you first transform the input with the X gates. So for the first four qubits, um, you, you have X gates on the first and the third qubit, which is corresponding to the first and the third bits. Um, and then you apply the R Y rotations and the X X gates and then the R X rotation. So we have uh, two parameters per qubit, which is the R Y rotation and the X X rotation. Um, and then you have one rotation for the R X gate, right? So which is two uh, N for the two N parameters for the first N qubits corresponding to the N bits. 
and you have one extra uh, rotation for the final qubit, right? So let's talk about the second parameters. Um, so for for each q and n, you have two n plus one um, one parameters, and you initialize those parameters to be uh, random between minus pi to pi, right? So now you have like two n plus one parameters, and you can apply these parameters to the circuit to uh, make some prediction, right? So um, you can see that we're uh, we're just going to apply some uh, parameter w to our uh, prediction function. Uh, so it's just a utility function for us to um, run, like generate the circuit using the QNN function that we defined before, and then apply that QNN apply the parameters that uh, we've given it, uh, and then take some measurement, and that will give us the uh, prediction for this task. Right, so you can see that here we take a bit string of one zero one one, um, and then you randomly initialize the weights to be between minus pi to pi. Uh, so you have two n plus one parameters, and you find out the prediction for the model. Right, so you you apply the bit string and the weights, and that gives you some value, and we consider that measurement value to be um, the prediction for that model. So the we're, we're uh, calculating the expectation of the Z observable, which means the values are bound between like minus one and one. Uh, so we want, but but our labels are between zero and one. So what we do is we shift that by, um, shift that to be between zero and one from minus one to uh, one, right? So the next step is to define a loss function, which is to tell you um, how far away we are from the ideal input. So what the what the square loss does is that it takes the set of predictions that your model made, uh, it takes the original labels for each data point, it subtracts that, and then averages um, averages over all of the data points in your training set. Right. Um, so that's basically the definition of the square loss. And the we have another utility function here, which basically takes all of the data sets. Uh, it makes a sorry, all of the data points, uh, makes a prediction on all of those data points, and then computes the square loss for the entire training set. And we consider that to be the cost over which we optimize for, right? Um, here's an example. Um, and basically, what's what that's doing is that it's um, taking some random parameters, uh, w. Uh, it's applying a training set. Uh, it's applying that to a QNN. Uh, and then using that QNN to make a prediction over the first five data points in your training set, uh, and then it's comparing the predictions that it that it made to the uh, actual label ground truth labels for that particular training example, and it um, it it's identified that the mean uh, square loss is uh, 0 0.28, right? So let's talk about the optimization routine, right? Because this is sort of the most interesting piece of this puzzle, which is um, how do you how do you optimize uh, how do you optimize a quantum machine learning model, right? Uh, so the simple answer is that we can uh, we can use um, gradient descent as our optimization routine, uh, but we would need to find a smart way to find the gradients for our quantum circuit itself, right? Um, so if you take your quantum circuit, then you want to uh, differentiate that quantum circuit over some uh, set of parameters. Um, um, over the set of parameters um, uh, of theta, right? Um, so how do we compute these gradients, right? So if you go back to your uh, trick classes uh, back in high school, then you would know that the, uh, like let's take the sine, sine function for example, right? Now the, the gradient of the sine function is, is, uh, is cos theta, right? And you can express cos theta as a shift of the original parameters for sine, which is sine theta plus pi by four minus sine theta minus pi by four, uh, the whole by root two, right? which means that the gradient for the original function sine theta can now be expressed in terms of uh, cos theta. Uh, so if you can evaluate sine theta, then you can evaluate the gradient for, um, for sine theta because it's now a function of itself, right? So um, more generally, this can be expressed as um, 
d of f theta by d theta is the original function shifted um, by pi by two and minus pi by two, um, and then uh, divided by two, right? So if you evaluate the same function by shifting the parameters uh, forward by pi by two and backwards by pi by two, um, now you, you get the gradient of that function, right? So functions that exhibit this property, um, like they're set to admit the parameter shift rule and it has a name, right? It's called the parameter shift rule. Um, and more generally, it can be expressed as uh, by this formula where you have um, like C and S um, where C is some constant uh, and S is the um, is the amount by which you're shifting those parameters uh, forward and backwards and evaluating it over that function, right? So the class of functions that exhibit this this trigonometric structure is, is said to admit the parameter shift rule. And luckily, quantum gates also admit this parameter shift property, which means um, which means that the we can use this uh, parameter shift property to find the gradients of our quantum circuit um, because the gates now admit this parameter shift property, right? Um, so the parameter shift property has, uh, so if you're familiar with finite differences, then this is very similar to finite differences, but has some key differences in the sense that the finite differences formulation uh, is a way to find uh, approximate, gra uh, approximate gradients, whereas the, um, parameter shift rule gives you the exact gradients uh, for that particular circuit, right? But the um, sort of catch here is that it's only exact based on the measurement noise. So if you have some underlying uh, noise in your measurement of your quantum circuit, which is highly likely if you're running it on an actual QPU, then um, the parameter shift rule is uh, exact up to that measurement noise. Uh, and it is influenced by that measurement size itself. Uh, so it is exact, but uh, only in the ideal case scenario when you have no noise, which is not the case. But this noise is uh, sort of acceptable to us at this point. So we you know, carry forward with it. Uh, and another key um, sort of consideration is that the values of S the amount by which you shift and the constant are dependent on the gates themselves. Um, and not all quantum gates exhibit this property, but most single quantum gates um, exhibit this parameter shift property, right? Um, so, so now that we've sort of uh, addressed the parameter shift rule and how we're going to find the gradients, uh, we can finally uh, define the functions that we would need to compute the parameter shift term for each of our parameters uh, over the entire data set, right? So basically what we're doing here is that we're taking the entire data set, um, we're taking the entire data set, and for each parameter, you are uh, computing what the parameter shift term for that particular uh, parameter is by evaluating the data set forward once and backward once by shifting the parameters by pi by two in each direction um, and computing the gradient for that particular um, position uh, in, in the parameter. So for each parameter in your uh, two n plus one parameters, you would do this, which means now you have uh, two into two n plus one uh, evaluation, right? Uh, which is extremely expensive. Uh, there are other more um, complicated techniques to kind of get around this problem. Uh, we'll, we'll look at them sort of uh, further down. Um, but this is sort of a simple scheme that you can use to compute the gradients of those parameters, right? Um, so now that we have a way to compute the gradient and we have all of the other ingredients for a great machine learning algorithm, uh, we can use uh, techniques from classical machine learning, which is uh, things like gradient descent, ADAM, uh, RMS prop, ADAGRAD, uh, any of these optimization techniques, uh, we can basically use to now train our um, train our neural network, our quantum neural network, right? So now you have, um, like, I'm just gonna train it over 100 epochs. Um, it, because the data set is also really small, um, this is not gonna take too long. Uh, it's about, I guess, four minutes. Um, and we can then plot our uh, training loss, right? So the, right, so Here's some things to think about while we wait for our model to train. Um, so why is this something that can't use for uh, something like images, right? Uh, so if you think about it, if even if you take something like, uh, so the, the bottleneck is sort of in the 
embedding itself. How do you transform this uh, classical data into um, into quantum data, right? Uh, in our simple example of parity detection, we're sort of just preparing that state by uh, considering uh, n cube, like the number of bit strings is equal to the number of qubits. Um, so if you employ, like if you use the same scheme to say embed images, right? Um, even for a 28 cross 28 Im image, uh, which is the size of the MNIST data set, you would need 784 qubits, right? Which is much more than um, what we can like efficiently simulate or, or, uh, or even like, have on an actual quantum computer, right? Uh, so this is this is one of the bottlenecks in actually applying this to uh, to something like like images, where um, where, the, where the dimension of the data is is really large, right? Um, so as we will see in the next notebook, uh, there are some interesting techniques where you can replace the um, the embedding format to be different, so that you can use that in images, similar to how we use the convolutional techniques in um, in, in classical deep learning, right? Um, let's see, how is our model completed training? Um, uh, hopefully this converges, <laughs> but yeah. So I think now might be a good time. We have the next minute for questions. I'm just gonna pop over to pigeonhole uh, to see if there were any questions. Oh, uh, there's a question about um, tensor network uh, backend. Uh, yes, we do have a tensor network simulator as well. Um, and you can check that out. I'll, I can post a link uh, after this notebook. Um, okay, awesome. So if you guys have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them on pigeonhole while we wait for another 30 seconds. Um, oh, we could go over this. Um, so just suggestions for further exploration, right? So if you, um, over, I mean, the course of today or uh, sometime before the hackathon, uh, some of the things that you can sort of play around with in this notebook are, how what happens when you change the variational circuit used to generate the prediction, right? Like, how do you come up with the optimal circuit um, to generate the prediction? And this is actually very similar to classical deep learning, where you kind of have this intuition, uh, or you have this heuristic where you change the architecture of the neural network, and then you try to experiment with it, uh, and then see what results it gives you. In a similar way, you can experiment with um, other variational circuits. You can try to use uh, some randomly generated circuit layer, right? Um, and you can, uh, you, if you can come up with some other techniques for transforming this classical data, uh, that's also really interesting. Um, and you can also experiment with other uh, optimization techniques for your variational circuit. Um, so some of the things that you can try are basically other flavors of gradient descent, uh, like RMS prop and Aragad. Uh, but you can also use some quantum aware optimizers, uh, like Rotosol, Rotoselect, and um, quantum natural gradient descent, right? Um, Let's see. Okay, so looks like um, looks like our model has completed training. If we plot the training loss, uh, let's see if we converged. Okay, so looks like we did converge, and we've converged to like zero, which is nice. Um, and then if you if we test our neural network now, we see that um, it's almost exactly right to um, uh, to our actual parity. So we were able to like predict the parity of our data set with like almost um, like like hundred percent accuracy, right? So one of the other things that you could also try is that this uh, parity is very similar to um, to an encoded like feature, like encoded features in, in machine learning, right? So if you had uh, some categorical variables, uh, then you can consider uh, those categorical variables to be um, to be binary, like zero and one, um, and you could very simply uh, replace the parity uh, detection here, or, or you could very simply replace the data for this exact same model, and you can uh, sort of try. Um, 
you you can try that out right and even if your features are not are not categorical you could also embed the data in if it was like say uh, continuous then you could embed that data by as rotations along uh, along the y axis right so in our original q and n you can now consider the um, the continuous um, continuous attributes to be uh, rotations along the y and then the with the d dimensional feature space that would be uh, d plus one dimensional and for any prediction task you could basically embed the d dimensional data as rotations along the y and um, and you could use that to perform your machine learning task right uh, so this these are some of the things that you can try uh, we'd love to see some of these in the uh, julia con hackathon um, and yes, the material for this workshop are available um, here. I just posted it in the comments. Um, you can copy paste that from there. And it's also going to be a banner on the video itself if you'd like to look at it. Um, but yeah, that, that sort of brings us to the um, end of this notebook. Uh, I'll let Catherine take it away for the next part, which is also an interesting uh, optimization algorithm. Um, if you're uh, so stick around. everybody, I'm back. Um, thanks again, SK, for the great introduction to quantum machine learning. Um, let me just pull up my next notebook. Uh, hopefully this is visible to everybody. Um, really quickly, uh, Mike asked if we would be able to get this notebook online somewhere. So the answer to that is yes. Uh, all the notebooks are available um, at the GitHub repository that has just been linked in the chat. Uh, so you can check them out and explore them on your own time, if you would like to. Um, and uh, so in this section, we're going to examine um, one of the preeminent algorithms that many people are working on using for applications of near-term quantum devices, um, QAOA. So we're going to talk about the application of this to a very famous optimization problem, graph coloring. Um, so I'll introduce what both of these are. Uh, we're going to, first of all, install a bunch of packages we need to run the script, introduce QAOA. Um, we're going to talk about the problems it can solve, um, a sneak peek, the answer is Kubo problems. Um, we're going to go through the example of graph coloring. And then finally, we're going to suggest some other problems that you could try and some real world use cases. Um, so I'm just going to apologize in advance. As you probably have all noticed, uh, it's impossible to have any name or acronym in the field of quantum computing that doesn't start or involve the letter Q, apparently except for bracket. So there's going to be a lot of uh, four letter acronyms with Q flying around here. And I'll try and go through this material slowly. Um, but please, if you have any questions, uh, sound off in the chat or at the pigeonhole uh, questions. Um, since we're making good time, we should have also time at the end of this session for a more general Q&A. Um, and besides that, uh, let's get started. Um, so we're first going to set up by installing a bunch of Julia and Python packages. I will start that right now. Um, since we're doing graph coloring, we're going to use the great Julia light graphs suite. Um, to generate some graphs, uh, perform operations on them. We're going to use graph plot and colors, Cairo, and compose to actually do some plotting of the graph, just to make the example we're going to do a little bit more concrete. Uh, finally, we're going to use NLopt for the optimization step. Um, and then our, uh, by now, old friends, PyCall and AWS. Uh, we're also going to be using uh, the standard libraries for linear algebra and sparse arrays for reasons we'll see in a bit. Um, so this ran pretty quickly for me because I actually have all these packages installed. For those of you who haven't yet installed all of like graphs, carrier or compose, this will probably take a little bit longer. Um, so most of the material in the next few cells is just me talking, so you can just let this run. Uh, and again, we import um, from bracket. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was just introduce the question of why we would want to color a graph. Um, what is this problem we're trying to solve? So there's lots of optimization problems that we encounter in the real world that can be phrased in terms of so-called graph coloring. Um, so in a problem like this, we have a set of vertices, which are connected by a series of edges, i.e. that's a graph, um, and we would like to paste each vertex in one of a set of bins called colors, um, that, such that no vertices which are adjacent in the graph share the same color. 
Um, so one of the most famous and visually appealing examples of this problem is the map coloring problem. So for example, if I would like to color a map of the United States or of a continent like Europe, it would be good if adjacent territories didn't have the same color because they're not, they need to be visually distinct, right? I need to see if I'm crossing the border between like uh, New York and New Jersey or between France and Germany. Um, it would be good if those two were not the same color in the graph. But of course, not every uh, country in Europe shares a border with every other country, which introduces the concept of vertices and edges. Um, and there's lots of other examples of uh, problems that could be phrased in terms of graph coloring. So for example, one which you might be interested in in the context of yesterday's workshop is scheduling tasks which are going to run on GPU workers. So if I have a very powerful cluster and my node has eight GPUs and I have like a hundred tasks, which are all, which would all like to run on a GPU, how do I efficiently schedule those tasks so that I make maximum use of the GPU and my CPU threads don't block? Um, another example, uh, which again, may be relevant to many of you in the chat is uh, if I'm creating exam schedules for university students. Uh, so my students all are taking, let's say like six or seven classes, there's a set of exam slots that um, is sort of time limited. There's only, we can't have exams last for four months. Um, so I need a way to assign students to exam slots such that no student is expected to write their, write two exams at the same time, but everybody is able to write, uh, um, able to write the exam that they need to write. Um, another famous example is assigning gates to aircraft at the airport. Um, So there are obviously a limited number of airport gates, like any airport you go to, and I need to find a way to assign incoming and outgoing aircraft to those gates such that aircraft don't slam into each other. It's good when that doesn't happen. Um, another very similar example is in subway planning. Um, I have a series of subway stations and, um, <laughs> and a, uh, a bunch of trains that need to visit the various subway stations. Again, it would be very good if the trains didn't hit each other. Um, and this can also actually be phrased in terms of a graph coloring problem. So there's lots of real world applications of these kinds of problems um, besides just coloring maps. Uh, and so in general, any problem where we have some sort of scheduling constraint, where I have many clients or workers that need to access scarce resources, uh, and there can be conflicts, can be usually phrased in terms of sort of some sort of graph calling problem. You might have noticed a similar theme here where there's many clients all trying to access a very scarce resource um, and they can't physically be in two places at once. Um, that's true of both subway trains and university students, uh, planes, I don't know. Um, so we would like to find a general procedure to sort of solve these graph calling problems. And this has actually been a very well-studied problem for over half a century. There's lots of really great classical algorithms to solve these kinds of problems. But today we're gonna look at a hybrid quantum classical application. Um, and so, yeah, you might well ask, like, there's lots of great existing algorithms that have been developed to solve this problem. Why do I need another one? Um, and so I'm going to introduce here the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, also known as QAO8, um, which was developed to make use of near-term quantum devices. So uh, if you've been following the news about quantum computing, you know that there are many different companies developing uh, quantum devices that they would like to use um, to solve various problems that they would like to allow other people to use for a fee to solve various problems. But the number of qubits uh, in each of these, um, <laughs> the number of qubits in most of these devices is very small, um, uh, usually less than a hundred. Um, and so, we're interested in finding a way to make effective use of these near-term quantum devices with fewer than 100 qubits, trying to develop quantum algorithms that will be useful when these devices have many hundreds or many thousands of qubits available for us to use. Um, so this is kind of the context in which QAOA and other similar algorithms, like the Variational Quantum Eigensolver, VQE, were developed. Um, and so we're gonna do something actually very similar to what happens in, right now is the state of the art in classical machine learning. Um, we're going to develop a solution that's a hybrid computation. Um, so that's what QAOA is. It's a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. The idea is to take a classical workload like optimization and accelerate it by offloading the part that is hard to a coprocessor. So in this case, a quantum device. But this is again, like I said, very similar to what we do in classical machine learning, where we take the hard part of the machine learning step and offload it to the GPU. 
And this dramatically speeds up um, machine learning training, and it's been responsible for a huge amount of progress in the field of machine learning in the past 15 years. Um, so we would like to kind of hopefully replicate something like this with quantum devices. Um, and so here I have this attractive graphic, uh, which can maybe make this a little bit more concrete for everybody. Um, so we have near-term quantum computers here, and we'd like to use them to effectively play the role that the GPU does in machine learning, but in this case for optimization problems. Um, okay. Uh, so QAOA is designed to solve what are called Kubo problems, or Kubo. Uh, you can pick which pronunciation you like most, which stands for Quadratic Unconstrained Binary Optimization. It's probably the only Q you will see in this workshop that doesn't stand for quantum. Uh, and so a Kubo problem is one that you can formulate as find a vector Y, which minimizes uh, the equation Z transpose QZ. So Z here is a vector and Q is a Hermitian matrix. Um, and Q is the matrix which is gonna encode our optimization problem. Um, and so the idea in QAOA is to say uh, solving, solving this um, solving sort of this uh, this optimization problem, i.e., finding the lowest lying eigenvector of Q here, is can be very hard for a classical computer. But it may be possible to come up with a quantum approach that can do better. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to rephrase this problem um, by by transforming this Q matrix into a Hamiltonian for for an easing model. Um, so if you're not super familiar uh, with what a Hamiltonian or the easy model are, uh, that's totally fine. Um, so effectively what we're doing here is we're taking a classical um, matrix eigensolving problem and rewriting it as a problem of quantum spins. So we have some quantum spins, which are these sigma operators here, um, which could also be considered as qubits. And then we have a function that encodes energy relationships or gates between those two, between pairs of qubits in the system. And what we want to do is um, is find the configuration of qubits that minimizes the energy of the entire system. Um, and so this is something we believe that quantum computers should be able to do efficiently, especially once we have more qubits than they're currently available today. Um, so the easing model has been very well studied. It's, uh, I think, over 100 years old now. It's very well understood from the perspective of statistical mechanics. So it's kind of a natural candidate um, to try and use to solve these sort of optimization problems. And Kubo problems can all be encoded in this format, which means if we can come up with a general training procedure for any Kubo problem, we can use that on any of these problems as long as we can find a way to, to first encode the Kubo problem in this easing formalism. Um, Hopefully that was not too confusing. Uh, so in QAOA, what we do is we apply two subcircuits in each layer of the optimization, the so-called cost circuit and the driver circuit. Um, so the cost circuit takes a variational parameter gamma and the driver circuit has variational parameter beta. Um, and so the trick in QAOA is to, uh, similar again to classical machine learning, um, uh, apply the objective function and update the variational parameters in response to drive the system towards the solution towards the, to the optimization problem. Um, and here, this quantum coprocessor can be, as we're going to do here, uh, a quantum simulator, or it could be a real quantum device. Um, OK, uh, so here we're going to implement a cost circuit and a driver circuit. Um, I have a utility function up here just in case somebody wants to run this later on uh, brackets Rigetti uh, interface because Rigetti does not support the ZZ gate. Um, so that's just what's going on up here. Um, so the cost circuit takes the easing Hamiltonian, the variational parameter gamma, the number of qubits, and the device we're going to want to run. Um, we're going to want to run our circuit on just in case we need to run it on Rigetti. Um, so we create a circuit. Uh, we find the um, Sort of, we find all the non-zero elements of the easing Hamiltonian, um, and then for each one of those, we apply a ZZ gate um, with a rotation specified by hyper by parameter gamma, um, and the parameter gamma is also mul also multiplied by the interaction strength in the easing Hamiltonian. Um, so, this is effectively going to apply this uh, this Hamiltonian to all of the qubits that we're going to use to simulate the system. Um, 
And this imposes sort of the energy cost. And then the hope is by applying the driver, we can slowly tune the system into its lowest lying eigenstate. Um, so I just realized I used this jargon without explaining it. So apologies for that. Uh, for those of you who um, haven't studied quantum mechanics before, uh, the lowest lying eigenstate or the ground state is the eigenvector of this uh, matrix um, H, or in this case, Jij. Uh, that's associated with the lowest lying eigenvalue or the ground state energy. Um, so all we're, all we're doing here is looking for the eigenvector associated with the smallest eigenvalue. Um, and then we also implement the driver circuit, which takes parameter beta and a number of qubits and qubits. Um, this is a little bit simpler. It just applies a rotation in the x direction on every qubit uh, scaled by two beta. Um, and so when we perform QAOA, we'll form layers of uh, first um, the cost circuit and then the driver circuit, um, and then optimize the parameters gamma and beta through repeated iterations of the training cycle. Um, OK. So as I just mentioned, we're going to be training these variational parameters. So for a QAOA circuit with n layers, so again, um, in this case, one layer is composed of two components, the cost and the driver. Um, we're going to have two n variational parameters, n beta and n gamma. And in this case, we're going to use the great Julia package uh, nonlinear optimization .jl or nlopt uh, to perform the optimization. Um, and the training function we're going to write can be used for any easing Hamiltonian that, de that describes a cubo problem, so not just graph coloring. All we'll need to do is generate an appropriate Hamiltonian. Um, and again, in this case, we're going to use the default simulator, which is free. Uh, so for graph coloring, the number of qubits we're going to need to solve the problem is the number of vertices in the graph times k, the number of colors we would like to use. Um, and again, since this runs locally on hardware you control, and I know many people are going to be watching this workshop on a laptop that doesn't have like a terabyte of RAM, we're going to restrict ourselves to small graphs and few colors so that this is accessible for people watching along at home. Um, if you, again, have access to uh, like a cloud instance with a lot of RAM or your personal desktop has a lot of RAM, or you want to try running this on a managed simulator that AWS provides, you can absolutely go to bigger vertex counts or more colors. Um, other options uh, would be to restrict yourself to two colors and go to larger graphs. Um, you could try running the training for longer, although it's going to take a long time. Um, or as I mentioned, use a managed simulator or one of your own machines with more RAM on it. Um, so now what we're going to do is build our generic training function. After we do that, we'll work on building the Kubo Hamiltonian for our particular problem. But first, we're going to write the generic training function that implements QAOA for us. Um, and we need to train, as I mentioned, the variational parameters beta and gamma for each layer of our QAOA circuit. Um, and we're going to do that using nloc.jl and whichever input using Hamiltonian we generate, which for now we haven't done. Um, and again, it's going to be totally agnostic of the specific Hamiltonian or Kubo problem, which is nice. So this is going to be super portable. Um, and we'll worry about dealing with that later. So to write the training function, we're going to need several components. Um, nloc.jl takes, takes an objective function f uh, which takes several arguments, params, and grad. Params, you can guess, is uh, the list of parameters we would like to train. Um, and grad, in this case, we don't need. It's the gradient. Um, for other optimization algorithms that we're not going to cover today, that might be relevant. But for now, um, we'll take the argument grad and not do anything with it. We need a way to initialize our parameters. Seems pretty reasonable. Um, we would like to be able to compute losses at each step. Uh, obviously, it's going to be hard to perform any optimization training if we have no way to compute losses and figure out if our results have become any more accurate. Uh, and then finally, we would like a way to track the losses and the current best solution we've uh, computed at every step in the training iteration. So that's four pieces that we're going to compute. Um, the first one of them is just going to be to initialize the optimization. Um, I've given it, again, the setting name init opt. Uh, super cool. Uh, <laughs> so this takes two arguments, um, the number of QAOA layers we want and the number of qubits in the circuit. Um, so we create a variable global min. That's the minimum energy we've encountered so far. I set this as like a huge number uh, because that way any energy, even the first energy we calculate will be much lower. Um, and we also uh, are going to keep track of the bit string configuration that generated the best energy we saw so far. 
So again, I just set this as all zeros for now because we'll be updating it as we go. Um, and then I initialize the parameters for my QAOA circuit, the betas and the gammas. It's just a series of random numbers. Um, you can probably imagine, and especially those of you who are familiar with machine learning, that the choice of initial parameters can have a big effect on how long it takes to train the circuit. Um, that's also true here. Um, but uh, for now, since this is since this is just a demonstration, I did the quick and dirty thing and just made them random real numbers. Um, if you're interested in exploring further, I definitely encourage people to try different initialization schemes for these variational parameters. Um, as you can probably guess, it depends on the problem. Um, so there's a, like, a lot of depth here, just as there is in regular classical machine learning about how you can best initialize your parameters. The overall parameters are just a, a cat of the betas and gammas. And then I create this tracker dict um, that's going to measure the cost at every step, uh, the values of the parameters at every step, the best energy seen so far, um, the best uh, configuration that generated that best energy. And then I'm going to also keep track of the energy and best configuration in every single training step. Um, so this is kind of long just because I added a bunch of comments explaining what everything does in case somebody wants to look at this without me talking over it. Um, so that's one of our functions, um, init opt. Uh, and then, so we've, uh, we've dealt with a way to initialize our parameters. Now we need a way to compute the losses of each training step. Um, so to do that, we're going to define this function apply QAOA. So this is going to take a, uh, a bracket circuit object, QAOA circ, um, the easing Hamiltonian, the device we want to run the circuit on, and the number of shots we'd like to use. Um, excuse me. Uh, so what we do is we run the QAOA circuit on the device um, and generate n shots output bit strings. Uh, and I've just included here, if you wanted to run this on a managed Amazon device, like one of our simulators or one of our QPUs, the only thing you would have to change is including the S3 folder you would like the results stored in. Um, just in case anybody does have an AWS account um, and wants to try this later. Um, and then we acquire the result, um, which again is just a series of bit string configurations. So this is going to be a matrix of dimension and shots, uh, number of qubits. So at each training step, you can get more output bit strings by increasing the number of shots, which means uh, you have more chances of finding a good bit string. But on the other hand, it's expensive to compute more shots. So you have to kind of find a balancing act there. Um, OK. Um, and then at every step, uh, these bit strings come back as zeros and ones. But the easing model actually expects results in terms of ones and minus ones. So the zeros will become minus ones. Um, that's what this line of code is doing here. Just turn all uh, zeros into minus ones to fit with the easing model expectation. Uh, from there, we compute um, effectively uh, this xqx um, to compute the energy. Um, so we compute the energy simultaneously using Julia's nice broadcasting over all of the uh, configurations we, we acquired from running the circuit on the simulator. Um, and then we compute the loss as the sum of all these energies divided by the number of shots. Basically, the average energy per shot is the loss at each step in the training. Um, and then at each step, we find the best energy we required so far, the minimum, um, since again, we're looking for the smallest energy or the smallest eigenvalue. Um, and then we extract the bit string associated with that energy minimum, the optimal state. Uh, and we return the loss, the minimum energy, and the best state. So this, uh, this apply QAOA function is going to compute the losses at each training step for us. Um, and this is where we're actually interacting with either like a real corner device or a simulator. Um, okay. And then finally, we write our actual training function. Um, so this is what nlopt.jl is going to use to optimize the parameters. We first initialize the parameters and the tracker that we created using initopt. We create our function f that I mentioned above that takes the two arguments, params and grad. Within f, we create the circuit um, using the current values of the parameters. Uh, and then we compute the loss, the minimum energy, and the best, uh, the best configuration in that uh, training iteration. We update the tracker, um, and then we return the loss. And then uh, we are going to use one of nlopt.jl's specific 
optimization algorithms. Here, I just picked Cobilla. Uh, I definitely also encourage people to try one of the many very good optimization algorithms NLOpt.jl provides and just see how that affects the accuracy of your results. We're going to try and minimize um, this function f. Uh, so our objective is to minimize it. Um, I minimize the loss. Uh, we're going to set the maximum number of iterations um, as whatever maximum iterations you want. Again, you can tune this number uh, if you're interested. And uh, for every um, for every run, sorry, for every iteration in the training, um, we're just going to update the parameters um, by optimizing uh, using this function f up here. And then finally, once we're done training, uh, we're going to return the tracker. Uh, OK. So now we have this generic training function that we can use to perform QIO and Julia. Um, and we can now focus on generating the specific easing Hamiltonian we're going to need to encode our graph coloring problem. Um, and so we're going to use likegraphs.jl to do this. We're going to generate a random graph and try to color it. We'll start off with six vertices and three colors so that we can stick to 18 or fewer qubits. Um, and that makes the problem tractable with the local simulator. So I'll ask for six vertices, seven edges between them, um, and three colors. Uh, and we're going to create an erdos reni graph, uh, which is just a random graph, using that number of vertices and number of edges. Um, so I'll do that right here. And then using the nice graph plot library, uh, we can plot uh, our very attractive looking graph. Um, this one's like a little ugly looking. Uh, this one's a little nicer because it's now fully connected. There's no vertex that's not connected to any other. Uh, you can just sort of play around with this until you get a graph you like that you're like, yeah, I would love to color that graph. Uh, Okay, so now we need to deal with the actual problem of generating the Hamiltonian. Um, so to generate the easing Hamiltonian, uh, we need to represent the constraints in the problem and then turn them into one of these quadratic matrices, uh, sorry, one of these matrices that will encode it in Kubo format. Um, so we want to color um, the graph with K colors, and that means each vertex ought to have a different color from all of its neighbors. Um, and so the way we're going to sort of encode all this information is create a vector of, um, of zero or one bits. Uh, and that vector is going to have length number of vertices times number of colors. So here I've created an example. The first four elements in this, um, if we had four colors and two vertices, the first four elements in this vector represent the four possible colors on vertex one. And the second four elements in this vector represent the four possible colors on vertex two. So in this specific example, I have that the first variable is one and the second to last variable is also one. So what this would mean would be that uh, we have um, that the first vertex has color one and the second vertex has color three. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to proceed. But if that isn't obvious, stare at this for a little bit um, and it should become a little more clear. Um, so to encode our constraints, we have we have sort of two constraints we need to satisfy simultaneously. Each vertex has to have one color at most. That makes sense. Um, so that means the sum over all colors uh, for a given vertex must be one. Um, uh, and then adjacent vertices have to have different colors, um, since this is the whole point of doing the graph coloring. Um, so. Uh, the sum for a given color of adjacent vertices V and W must be less than or equal to one, um, given that VW are adjacent. Um, and so we're going to encode the constraints into an NV times K, NV times K matrix that will serve as the Hamiltonian for this problem. Um, and again, we're going to find the lowest lying eigenvalue. Um, and the corresponding eigenvector should be a solution to the optimization problem. Uh, and so the quadratic part comes from the fact that we want to minimize y. Uh, we want to minimize. We want to find the vector y that minimizes x transpose cx. Um, and right now we have this in terms of a linear optimization problem. So if we just do ax minus b and then square it, uh, we can generate a quadratic optimization problem from there. Um, and again, just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. But if you're confused, ask on Discord later uh, or after uh, the talk. Um, and so this is going to give us 
two sets of um, two matrices, each representing one of our two constraints. We're going to have one matrix uh, with a penalty P1 for violating each vertex must have one color. We're going to have a second matrix um, with penalty P2 for violating uh, constraint two, which is the adjacent vertices must have different colors. And these penalties are arbitrary. We're just going to want them to be greater than zero. Um, and so first, we'll compute the matrix that represents the first penalty, uh, i.e. enforce that each vertex has one color at most. Um, so I just set P1 here as 8 because I like the number 8. Um, and we are going to um, create a matrix J that represents this constraint. So again, we said that to enforce that each, each vertex has one color, um, uh, we have to sum for each single vertex over all colors, and that should be one. Um, and so in that case, uh, we apply this. Um, and we generate something that's got sort of this block sparse structure. This will be the same for any graph we pick because uh, there's no information here about the like actual structure of the graph. There's no ma information about the adjacency matrix or anything here. So this would always look the same for basically any graph. Um, the only thing is the size of the blocks would change depending on the number of colors. Uh, and now we're going to handle the second set of constraints, which is that adjacent vertices ought to have different colors. Um, so that's this constraint here, that if we sum over all adjacent, if we sum over adjacent vertices for a given color, that should be less than or equal to one. So there should be a penalty uh, if that uh, is um, a group, sorry, if that's greater than one. Uh, and in this case, we now extract the adjacency matrix structure. Um, and we apply penalty P2. Again, I made this eight because I love the number eight. Um, so we uh, iterate over the non-zero values in the adjacency matrix um, and then apply the penalty P2 uh, to account for this adjacency constraint. And having done so, um, we can see now that we have our original block sparse structure representing the first penalty. And now there's a bit more interesting structure going on here representing the penalty for adjacent vertices having the same color, um, which is represented by fours here. Okay, uh, so now what we'll do is we'll actually run our QAOA training algorithm on this graph and try and color it. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll print out a trace of the best energy that we found at each step and, in, and finally a representation of the solution. So I'm gonna run this with two QAOA layers because it's gonna make the problem a little easier to solve. And I'm gonna also run it with a thousand shots per training iteration. This makes sense to do because the local simulator is gonna compute the shots very quickly. Uh, and with a small depth, it'll be easier to get training results. We don't need a huge depth here because the graph we're trying to solve is pretty easy. It's like quite small, right? Um, and we're again gonna run this on the local simulator. If you would like to run this on AWS managed infrastructure later, uh, I've included, commented out a way you can do so. Uh, so I'll start running. Do It's going to take a second, so I will take a drink of water. Local simulator working hard. All right, hopefully this will finish pretty quick. Um, and then we can see whether it did actually successfully color. Uh. Okay, well, while we wait for this to finish, since I don't want to rob SK of his time, um, I can show you a previously computed solution uh, where it did in fact succeed in coloring a similar graph. Um, and we're able to plot this with gplot, um, just assigning colors to each of the, um, uh, assigning colors to each of the vertices. So QAOA did in fact succeed in that case in coloring a uh, graph with uh, six vertices. Oh, there we go. So this is finally finished. Um, let's see what the, what the coloring looks like for the graph we started with earlier. Oh no! Um, so this one actually did not generate a particularly good solution. 
Uh, it's not that surprising. Uh, QIOA can fail. The idea is that you'll generate a solution that's good enough. This doesn't always work, um, even for such a small graph, uh, which is very sad. Um, and uh, so for other simpler graphs, which have lower connectivity uh, or fewer neighbors per vertex, this often works better, which is, again, not super surprising. Uh, so just to sum up what we covered in this session, uh, there's lots of important optimization problems which can be formulated in a Cubo format. Um, these are often amenable to acceleration with a hybrid classical quantum approach. Um, and one algorithm that you can use to do this is QAOA, which we implemented above. Um, so again, this is a lot to take in. If you're confused about this, I definitely recommend looking up more materials in QIOA um, or going through this notebook again. Another great problem to try if you're uh, sort of like a little fuzzy on how this works is max cut. Uh, there's a lot of good sort of graph theory problems that are very amenable to cubal formulations. Um, and one thing you also might well ask, especially since my example here in real time did not work so well, is like, what's the point of, of doing all this for so many, for so few qubits, you know, like we only did 18 and you only colored a graph with six vertices, which didn't even work that well. And second of all, like with my eyes, I can color that graph. Thank you very much. Um, furthermore, even for more complicated graphs, we have really great classical approaches. Uh, for example, those of you who use jump.jl know that jump, sorry, um, Jump is great at coloring graphs. It's really good. Um, or even if you wanted to do this in the Cubo format, uh, I said that we were looking for the lowest lying eigenvalue. Well, we have really great classical eigensolvers, so why not just use that? Um, and those are all very fair points. Um, so this this field of looking at sort of new quantum classical approaches is a very nascent or embryonic field. Um, there's a lot of interest in using what we hope will be quantum devices with many hundreds or even many thousands of qubits to eventually do better than existing classical approaches for these optimization problems. But the operative word there is kind of eventually. So this is like a very active area of research. And for you know your, your sort of quotidian problems, uh, like if, if I came to you tomorrow and I was like, please optimize on a subway timetable, my commuters are dying, uh, no, no trains can go you would use a classical optimization approach in the real world. Maybe you would try QAOA thinking, you know, in 10 or 15 years, I will be able to come up with a much better graph coloring approach for my subway timetables or my students going to their exams once quantum computers have advanced and we have much better technology. Um, but for now, I'm going to keep this QAOA approach um, as sort of a research topic and not maybe super ready for production just yet. Um, and maybe actively investigate it, but not put all your eggs in the one basket of, I'm gonna use a 15 qubit device to solve uh, who's going to calculus two on Wednesday. Um, so I guess I, I just wanna emphasize that this is like still a very new area. There's a lot of promise to it, um, but you wouldn't necessarily use this for, uh, like please nobody watch this and actually start scheduling uh, air, airplane dates. Um, and, uh, we're hoping that this will enable us to drive more algorithmic improvements in quantum computing in general. So stay tuned on that front. Um, and there's a lot of areas you can use to explore this further. For example, how does the number of shots or number of layers, like the number of QAOA layers, affect your results? There's lots of different types of random graphs you can try. Like graphs um, is a wonderful package and has many different types of graphs like this. Uh, you could try a different Kubo problem. Like I mentioned, max cut is a great one. Other good ones are minimum vertex cover, quadratic knapsack. knapsack problem and max click. Um, we also have a tutorial on bracket itself uh, written in Python to do QAOA for max cut, um, which you can try. And there are even uh, very nice graph coloring encodings for QA QAOA, which use fewer than NV times K qubits. So they're like qubit fru frugal, if you like. Um, that would be a cool challenge to implement during the hackathon, uh, if you were interested. Um, and yeah, uh, so I will hand it back to SK now for the second part of the quantum machine learning section. Um, thanks for your attention. Uh, and I will see you all during the conclusions. Thanks everybody. Thanks Catherine. Um, I also hope that nobody uses uh, quantum cubo for train scheduling because our trains are already running late most of the time. Uh, uh, okay, so the next uh, next portion of this workshop is uh, about convolutional neural networks, uh, which are very similar to convolutional neural networks. If you um, if you're familiar with um, image processing or deep learning for um, image processing, right? So 
We'll start with, uh, just as before, we'll start with installing all the prerequisites. Uh, again, if you're using the Docker container, you don't need to do this. Um, you then import all of the required libraries. Um, and again, just as before, we're going to be running this on the uh, local simulator. Um, <clears throat> And you could quite simply change this one line to run this on uh, an actual quantum computer if you chose to do it, or on one of the managed simulators, right? Um, so we'll start with all of the same um, all of the same steps in from our previous machine learning notebook apply to this notebook as well. Um, except in this notebook, what we're going to be looking at is um, is a classical or, or a quantum technique to embed data uh, and then using a classical algorithm to perform the actual um, machine learning task. In this case, it's going to be um, um, classification. It's, it's multi-label classification. And the data set that we'll be using is the Fashion MNIST data set. Uh, so if you're familiar with the MNIST data set, it's the handwritten digit recognition data set. Uh, Fashion MNIST is the analog to that data set. It's a drop and replacement for that. Uh, here we have um, images of um, apparel, and you classify the images of the apparel into one of 10 classes, right? Uh, so there's t-shirts, trousers, pullovers, dress, coats. Um, well, basically, I've listed all of them here, right? Um, so Julia has a great uh, library, ML datasets, where we can uh, directly pull in the Fashion MNIST dataset. Uh, we're going to do that first. Um, and we can sample a few images from this data set, right? Um, all right, I'm not sure why this is taking so long, <laughs> but uh, basically it's images of um, of a battle, right? Uh, yeah, here so you can see that the shirt, uh, it's black and white images uh, or grayscale images, and you have, um, it, it's 28 cross 28, um, 28 cross 28 uh, images of a panel. Um, so this is the data, and this is the label for that, the ground truth label for that data, right? So we have sneakers, trousers, sandals, um, bags, pullovers, and whatnot. So what we're going to be doing in this notebook is to design a feature extractor uh, that's based off of uh, variational circuits. So if you're familiar with traditional um, computer vision and image processing, uh, you're familiar with uh, kernels and filters that do specific things to the um, to the image uh, to perform specific tasks. So for example, uh, there are kernels that you can apply to a local region of each image to get the edges in that image uh, if you wanted to do edge detection. And this is outside of deep learning, outside of machine learning. Um, this is just plain old computer vision uh, where, where you have a matrix that is capable of um, detecting the edges in an image. And then you just pass that on through the image and then that gives you the uh, edges uh, in the image, right? Similarly, in classical deep learning, you have this concept of convolutional filters, which are learnable kernel filters that you can apply to um, your input data uh, to extract features from each of those regions to later use that for uh, prediction in uh, like either a ResNet or, or some dense layer, right? So typically uh, your classical convolutional workflow goes as you have an input data, you apply the convolutional filter to each uh, local region of that image, you extract that the features from that local image, uh, local image region, and then you um, basically keep doing that layer by layer, and then you pull each of those um, convolutions, and then you would apply something like a dense layer followed by a softmax uh, to get the final output for uh, the classes that you're trying to predict. Right. So now in our convolutional neural network case, we're going to be doing the exact same thing, except what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be replacing the convolutional filters with uh, quantum convolutions, right? Which is basically um, you would apply a variational circuit for each local region of the image, and this works particularly well because we are uh, the because the qubit limitations that we have. Uh, now, instead of having a 20, instead of requiring a 28 cross 28, uh, which is like 784 qubits, um, you can simply have four qubits and then encode the image uh, using those four qubits, right? 
So basically what you would do is that you have a variational quantum circuit uh, that has some parameters and you would rotate and similar to the variational quantum circuit that we had before, um, it would begin with uh, a set of uh, RY rotations um, and you would rotate the each qubit by the intensity of that pixel, right? So you would take a four cross four region, uh, you would see the four pixels uh, in that region, and then you would have a four qubit quantum circuit, and you would basically um, use the pixel values to perform an RY rotation as the first layer of that uh, quantum circuit. And then you can, um, you can perform some random computations uh, and then measure each of those qubits to then generate a, 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 quant a, a convolutional volume, right? So if you started with a 28 cross 28 image uh, and you applied a two cross two filter across that a convolutional filter across the image, then you would end up with um, 14 cross 14 cross four uh, pixel volume, right? And you can now use that pixel volume uh, to then perform a classification um, on your original data set, right? So um, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be using Amazon Bracket uh, to generate the convolutional filters, right? Uh, so this circuit is now your uh, convolutional filter. Uh, just like I mentioned before, uh, you take the pixel values um, and then you apply use those as parameters to your first layer of uh, rotation around the y-axis. And then you have some random uh, gate, like combination of gates in every subsequent layer, right? So uh, here I've kind of hard coded that. Uh, you can basically change this to have a different random quantum circuit, or you can uh, design this layer based on your predetermined knowledge about the problem, right? So then what we do is that we measure each of the expectation uh, around the Z uh, for um, each qubit, and then use that as the pixel value for that channel. So this would basically take a two cross two image, uh, 2D image, two cross two 2D image section, and then convert that into um, one cross four uh, volume. And then if you do that for the entire image, now you take the 28 cross 28 image and then convert that into a 14 cross 14 cross one volume, um, right? So, sorry, 14 cross 14 cross four volume, right? So now what we do is that we have a utility function to basically take the um, image two cross two image section and then uh, take the pixel value of that two cross two region and then apply that uh, to this quantum circuit, right? Where the parameter, it's, it's parameterized by the pixel values basically. And uh, and then it has these random layers. And then um, you basically have this function basically takes, uh, does that, runs your circuit and then gives you the output. Uh, and it basically gives you that um, pixel volume of 14 cross, sorry, one cross, one cross four, right? Um, so now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna pre-process our entire data set with, um, with these uh, convolutional filters. So we're gonna take the, uh, we're gonna take the about a sample set of around 10 images, just so we don't, spend the rest of today uh, trying to train this. Uh, but you take this um, like like 10 training images and 10 testing images, and then you apply the quantum usual filter to each of those images, right? So then what we can do is that we can randomly sample um, a few of the images from our feature extractor, right? Uh, so you see that um, these are each of the channels for our um, that the convolution produce, or the quantum convolution produce, and this is our original image. So we take, um, all right, so let's go here. Um, so we took a 28 cross 28 image and then produced a 14 cross 14 cross four uh, pixel volume, right? So this image is the original image, which is 28 cross 28 cross, uh, 28 cross 28. Um, and then each of these are the 
uh, our one channel for that image. So this is the first channel that was produced by our uh, quantum convolutional circuit. Uh, and then uh, this is the second uh, second channel, this is the third channel, this is the fourth channel, right? So then now what we can do is we can take this, um, take the features extracted by our convolutional um, circuit and then apply a normal machine learning model on it, right? In this case, what we do is that we simply uh, pass that through uh, two dense layers and then try to make a prediction um, based off of um, the final softmax layer that we apply to get the uh, distribution over the 10 classes that we have. Um, we use a logic cross entropy loss, um, which is basically log loss in the multi label uh, classification scenario. And then we measure our accuracy by understanding how many of those predictions in each batch did we get right. right? Um, so now what we can do is that we can take the um, extracted features and then pass them through our classical machine learning model. Um, and then this is simply training it for 10 epochs, uh, but you know you could potentially do this for as many epochs as you want and you can use the entire training set. So keep in mind that this is um, also just like a very, very minimal uh, subset of our original training set, um, just so that we can like, you know, complete that um, within the time for this workshop. Uh, and then we can see that the loss, the training loss in this case has reduced uh, to pretty low, but then the test loss is basically not, not reduced at all. Um, this could be due to one of several factors, uh, one of which is that we didn't really use the entire training set. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, just definitely uh, play around with the training sizes and some of the hyperparameters in this um, in this notebook uh, to try to see how what's the minimal like you know testing loss that you can get, right? Um, this is the accuracy that we've gotten. Um, but what you should be asking me right now is that if you have a keen eye, <laughs> you're probably seeing that um, this is very similar to having a convolutional filter but then applying some random perturbation on that uh, convolutional filter instead of uh, learning anything useful. So why does this work, right? Uh, so what, what they've showed in the original paper is that there are certain limitations to um, how well this can work. And the advantage is probably in the amount of uh, like, how fast you can converge to um, to a better loss and how you can get better accuracy, right? If you're interested in reading about that, you should definitely read the original paper. I can link that in the chat. Um, but at this point, this just seems like um, like random perturbations uh, on the original image. So um, you know you can define like smarter filters using these uh, quantum circuits, uh, and you can sort of try that out. So one thing that I would uh, definitely recommend as uh, future exploration is that you can um, try to see if you can design one of the original um, like kernel filters, like the Sobel filter, the Gaussian filter, if you can uh, try to use quantum circuits uh, to do that. Um, and you can also try to see if you can um, replace the uh, classical model training with, um, with some quantum algorithm, right? Like the original variational quantum um, um, quantum circuits that we saw in the previous notebook. Um, the other thing that you could try, uh, and I would definitely recommend that you try this, um, is to also see how you can train this end to end uh, instead of having just the um, just a random layer with uh, the pixel values uh, that are passing through those random layers. What you can try is also to uh, use the parameter shift rule to compute the gradients for that convolutional layer and then learn this end to end based on the loss that you're seeing in the, um, um, in, in the once you pass the entire training data through it, right? Um, so yeah, so these are just a few things that you could try. Um, that sort of brings us to the end of this notebook. Um, so I think somebody else also asked this question uh, in the pigeonhole, which is what is the speed up of the QNN as compared to a neural network? Um, so the original paper, uh, which is quantum circuit learning, 
uh, I linked it in pigeonhole as well. So um, that actually has a lot of details about the actual quantum advantage that you can uh, get. Uh, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of this is very theoretical, very like still in, in, in the research phase and people are still trying to explore uh, these questions. So if you're curious about this and you should definitely um, sort of go try it out, uh, but the actual speed up may not necessarily be in the um, actual, time to computation itself, but it might be in getting better results, or at least that's the direction in which people are sort of um, trying to push this towards, right? Like, how can you use these variational algorithms to get better results on some of these data sets? Um, so do, uh, if, if anybody had questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Um, is there a way to output a circuit in a latex format. Um, unfortunately, no, there isn't. Uh, but you could uh, definitely explore. Um, yeah, but if you wanted to get the cat notation, there's this great latex package called bracket, which you could use. Um, so is anybody um, following along with this with us? Um, and if you're having um, any trouble with that, that now would be a good time as well. So thanks everybody for following along with us so far. So that was the last sort of main content notebook we had. Uh, we wanted to finish up just with the discussion of some further resources that you guys can check out to learn more about quantum computing. Um, and so maybe more inspiration for projects you could pursue on your own or things you could work on at the hackathon. Um, so for those of you who are interested in learning more about quantum computing, the canonical textbook that almost everybody uh, I know has learned from is the famous Nielsen and Chuang. Uh, we have a link here. Um, you can find it online um, at you know whatever your favorite bookstore is. Uh, most academic bookstores will have it. Um, John Preskill also has a very uh, wonderful series of course notes uh, for classes taught at Caltech for many years. I believe those are available in their entirety online. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, we also have a large series of example notebooks at uh, Amazon Bracket. They're all in Python, but um, I think many of you either know Python or would quickly be able to translate the ideas into Julia. Um, also, we would be remiss if we didn't mention um, that Yao has a very extensive set of tutorials, which are very good. So if after this, you looked at this and you were like, you know what, I hate the way they wrote this code, it's, it's terrible. Um, I want to use something more Julian, uh, maybe more compact. Uh, definitely check out the yao.jl tutorials. Um, Kiskit, uh, which is IBM's um, sort of quantum computing framework, has a whole textbook written in Python about how to learn quantum computing. Uh, it's very well developed. Uh, I definitely suggest people check that out. And if you're interested in a lot of what SK has been talking about, about um, machine learning, and also about optimization. Um, Bracket also works with a Python package called PennyLane that's uh, sort of devoted to creating, it's kind of like Keras for quantum computing uh, for those of you from the machine learning world. So they have a lot of really great demos. Um, if you want inspiration for the kind of problems you can attack or to learn more about quantum computing, those are great to check out. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, 
And if you're interested in learning more about future projects or hackathon ideas, again, the Penny Lane Library has examples of lots of different hybrid quantum algorithms. Um, you could try implementing some of these yourself directly or using Yao. Uh, last February, and I believe next year as well, there will be um, this quantum hackathon uh, called QHack. Uh, you can find a lot of write-ups of winning submissions if you're interested. Um, a lot of them are on archive or were written up on the Penny Lane blog. So you could definitely try reproducing those in Julia. For example, there's lots of like cool examples for finance, for if anybody is coming from sort of the financial technology world um, or problems for optimization. Um, like I mentioned in the QAOA section, there's lots of optimization problems you can express in the Cubo form. Check out some of the links there if you want to try doing stuff like, yeah, like max cut, minimum vertex cover, uh, circuit sat, um, lots of different problems like that. Well, there's also the Unitary Fund, uh, which provides grants for people who are writing open source software in the quantum space. Um, most of these are pretty small, like several thousand dollars, but it can be enough to get off the ground if you're interested in writing, for example, open source Julia code that works in the quantum computing field. Um, we also have the Quantum Open Source Foundation, which matches open source developers with mentors, um, including from our team, as SK can tell you more about in a second. Uh, and then finally, um, one thing that's, I think, for us very special that we just wanted to mention is that Amazon Bracket and BMW, the car manufacturer, are holding a quantum challenge right now uh, with submissions due September 24th. So if you're interested in participating, there are credits being offered so that you can run, if you're a team participating in the challenge, uh, you can apply for credits to run your submission on a managed simulator or QPU through Amazon Bracket. And if you win, there are some very cool prizes. Um, so if that's something that sounds interesting to you, definitely follow this link. Um, and yeah, SK, did you want to talk about the Quantum Open Source Foundation a little bit? Sure. That sounds yep. cool that you um, might be interested in. <laughs> so the Quantum Open Source Foundation uh, is basically, um, well, just that uh, they support um, advances in like open source software for quantum computing. Uh, they have a great mentorship program. I've gotten a lot from that program uh, and a lot of people from Amazon also participate in that uh, program uh, to offer mentorship uh, to people that want to learn more about quantum computing. Um, there's also some great um, efforts uh, right now uh, that are coming up uh, to match you with research mentors, help you answer research questions uh, and go and basically go in um, uh, in directions where the field is heading uh, to create more open source software, right? Uh, you can learn more uh, about the quantum um, and some of the projects that people in that mentorship program have done. Um, uh, I can post a link in chat as well. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that's what we do. And definitely there's a Slack, uh, there's a Discord and all of that. So definitely um, uh, make sure to join them. Um, um, yeah. And, but oh, sorry. Yes. So um, this is going to be my last section. So one thing uh, I also wanted to mention was if anybody here is an academic or a grad student and you're interested in doing research on real quantum devices with Bracket, we do have research credits specifically for people uh, performing like scientific research. Um, so if you're interested in that, check out the link to the AWS Cloud credits, which can be used on the Bracket service. Um, and if you want to know more, uh, contact us offline. Um, and then finally. Away. <laughs> uh, still grabbing a link. <laughs> uh, okay, then I will uh, finish this off then too. Yeah, so I just wanted to finally mention that we are hiring. Um, so if you're interested in getting paid to work on quantum software, uh, AWS is hiring for a variety of roles. Uh, we have a pretty broad quantum computing effort. Both for people who are like, if you're a software engineer and you don't have a big background in quantum computing, that's not a problem. We have lots of people who are extremely effective members of the team who didn't know anything about quantum computing before joining. Uh, there's people like me who are research scientists in a variety of areas, not just theory. Um, we have product managers, technical writers, others. Um, also, uh, since I know there are a lot of young people who are attending the conference, we do have positions in the summers for interns. So the current round has already kind of expired, but if you're interested next summer, we should have positions for interns. Um, and then if you want to find out more about open positions, check our jobs page. Uh, and again, feel free to talk to either of us offline if you have any questions about it. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for attending. I know we're finishing a little early, so if people want to ask questions in the chat or just take some time to go get some lunch or something or dinner, whatever time zone you're in, breakfast, I don't know. Um, 
yeah, thanks everyone for attending. I hope it was worthwhile. the streams on mic. Okay, yeah, so someone mentioned there are some unanswered questions in Pigeonhole. Uh, let me just pull up the questions. Uh, uh, okay, one second. Um, give me one moment. I will pull up the questions very quickly. Yeah, so here are the pigeonhole questions. We can just go through these uh, quickly. Um, so the one with the number one amount of votes is Adit's question. How did you both end up working on Amazon Bracket? Um, so I can very quickly answer this, which is that I, for myself, obviously, uh, which is I was a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute in New York. Um, and uh, there I was working on tensor network methods for condensed matter physics. Um, and I got contacted about an opportunity at Amazon Bracket. It seemed very exciting to me, so I ended up interviewing and joining the team as a research scientist, and I've been here for a little over a year. Um, okay. um, I was a software engineer at Amazon, uh, working on at Amazon AI, and then I heard about Amazon's new service called Bracket uh, that was in preview. So I signed up to get on the beta, and I loved the product so much that I was like, OK, I have to go work on this. Uh, so that's how I kind of interviewed and got, got here. And um, just just so you know, um, I had no knowledge about quantum computing um, at all before I came into this. So uh, this is like a, the last, I think, year has been like amazing in terms of like uh, learning experience. And the team's like great to work with as well. And don't let SK be modest. He's definitely one of the best engineers on the team. Um, perhaps because he didn't know a huge amount about quantum computing. Not like people like me who like just use jargon all the time and can't explain ourselves. <laughs> um, uh, so um, another question, which has five votes and wasn't uh, answered so far, it looks like, is what are the prospects of quantum computing for numerical analysis slash computer arithmetic? Does it allow a better representation of real numbers than floating point format? Um, so I guess I can take this one. Uh, so um, there are proposals to use quantum computers to do things like solve differential equations. Um, Yao actually has a really great tutorial about this. I would strongly suggest people check out. Um, another example, uh, which I've kind of alluded to during my optimization talk, but didn't really discuss in depth, is using quantum computers for eigen solving. Um, so uh, the trick here is that, like, internally in the, in the quantum computer, of course, because it's like operating, if you like, in the real world, um, you know, like if you had a perfect noise free quantum computer, you could represent like any floating point number ostensibly, you know, with the infinite accuracy. If you believe that there's like no sort of like small grain scale to the universe or whatever. The problem is, of course, doing readout, right? Because once you have to actually read out the number in a way you can recognize, then you can like introduce truncation problems and things like that. Um, uh, so I, I mean, it, it depends what you mean by a better representation of real numbers than floating point, because at the end of the day, you'll probably need to com like communicate with some sort of classical computer, um, and then you introduce all the problems we have that you probably know about very well with the classical representation of floating point numbers, for example. Um, and uh, so I say it's like uh, the situation with like 
differential equation solving is similar to the one for optimization, where there's a lot of like promising algorithms, but nobody's necessarily demonstrated a huge advantage to using them yet. It's definitely an active area of research. So if that's something that interests you, um, I believe the out tutorial has a lot of good references to the original archive papers that discuss this idea. So uh, check it out if you're interested. Um, I think that's got answered. Um, somebody asked, what drove you to use Julia for quantum computing? Uh, SK, you want to grab that one? Sure. Um, I think one of the things was that Julia has a great uh, ecosystem around like optimization. We have like Optim, NLOP, uh, Flux, um, and there's also ways to embed like graph coloring problems like jump. Uh, so we were really interested in seeing uh, if you've seen Catherine's talk before about how you can use the QPU, uh, similar to how you use the GPU. Um, for optimization, we wanted to see how we could integrate into each of these libraries. Um, another sort of slight goal for us uh, was to also get more people um, to build a community around like Amazon Bracket in Julia. Uh, we don't have a Julia SDK yet, but we would be like more than willing to have um, uh, like people contribute to that SDK, um, very similar to the one that we have in Python. Um, so that that's sort of what what drove us to kind of use Julia today. Yeah, um, I guess I would just also add that we know there's like a lot of you know obviously very smart people in the Julia community. It would be great to have more people working on quantum computing in general from Julia. Um, and yeah, like Eska said, we wanted to use all the great Julia packages that I mean, you guys all know about. So. Um, see what else. Uh, somebody asked how to contact us after the workshop. Um, so uh, one option would be the Discord for the conference, which should be available to everybody. Um, ask the conference organizers. Otherwise, uh, we are both on Slack, on the Julia Lang Slack. Um, and we're both on Twitter. Uh, if you give me a second, I can put our Twitter handles into the chat. Um, and those are probably the easiest ways to get a hold of us. Oh, okay, so there's the next question, which is, hi, I was wondering about any AWS bracket hardware limitations and how they reflect on the interface. Um, so the awesome thing about like bracket is that we have, um, we integrate with different hardware providers. Um, like we have Spaghetti, IonQ, and uh, DJM on our platform. Uh, we're constantly expanding on that offering as well. Uh, so we have um, like a, we're, we have a lot more like hardware providers that are coming. Um, so you should definitely, um, so hardware limitations itself are dependent on the vendor. Uh, and the, we, we have the calibration data and the qubit connections um, that are displayed on the bracket console itself. Uh, if you go on them, so you can use that to basically um, design your actual quantum circuit in a way that uh, that works on these specific uh, hardware vendors. And we've also made it really simple to switch between these hardware vendors um, that um, with just like a single line of code. Uh, so that, that should be pretty simple enough. Um, so another one we haven't uh, yet gotten to is how does AWS perform in numerical simulations when comparing with the owl, for example? So this is a little bit complicated to answer because um, AWS provides a bunch of different managed simulators, like you mentioned. We have a state vector simulator, a tensor network simulator, the noise simulator, DM1, and then all of the managed GPUs. Um, so the first thing to, would be to just like discuss which simulators it is we want to compare. As far as I know, nobody's done a direct benchmark comparison of the internal Yao simulators versus uh, our managed ones. Um, that would actually be a very cool hackathon project if anybody's interested in doing that. Um, or uh, if anybody is even interested um, in uh, doing that, for example, as some sort of like quantum open source project, um, like a shootout between the different simulators across providers, uh, because, for example, like IBM's Qiskit has a simulator, Google Circ has one as well. 
Um, so if you're interested in uh, kind of having like an apples, apples comparison here, this would be a really great project uh, to compare the various simulators that um, different groups are offering. Um, I can take the next one. Uh, so there's uh, there was a question about like uh, quantum computing to simulate biological reactions. Um, so there's a lot of great work in this direction. Uh, I know that there's some quantum algorithms for um, protein for the protein folding problem as well. Um, so this specifically to these algorithms, I'm I'm not sure, uh, but there is some like awesome work in that direction uh, that I can point you to. So I think the last sort of still relevant unanswered question is uh, Julian's about whether it's possible to do arbitrary POVM or are we limited to projections for measurements? So um, the answer to that is simply right now we're limited to projection only measurements at the end of the simulation. Um, and I think that's everything. Uh, so again, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, I really hope it was worthwhile. Um, and if you have any more questions or want to learn more, feel free to contact us anytime. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and everybody, um, have a great rest of Tuliacon. Yep. See you guys. Uh, Bye. It was